Okay, Jack. All righty. We are live and you are a co-host. We are recording and Amherst Media is in the house. So you are good to begin. Okay. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 1st, 2021. My name is Jack Jumpsick and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at what, 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to the uh, chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, the planning board meeting, uh, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listings for this meeting, or go to the uh, planning board webpage and click on the most uh, recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Uh, no in-person attendance of the public will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access um, the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for the reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other correspondence uh, of the record of the proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call when I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Uh, Maria Chow. Present. Uh, Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Here. Okay. And uh, I'm myself, of course. Um, board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and is reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard on a, uh, at other appropriate times in the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited, if you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address. Put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Uh, residents can express their views up to three minutes at the discussion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation uh, will be disconnected from the meeting. So with that, um, we have no minutes to review, correct? That is correct. All right, so we have, let me bring up, um, looks like we have five attendees. Uh, this is a public comment period. Um, if anybody would like to speak, I see two hands, three hands. Uh, Susanna Muspratt, then Hilda Greenbaum, and then Pam Rooney. Mr. Jamsik, I also, um, to let you know, I have the, the timer. If you Can't would... hear you, Pam. Jack, I have the timer if you need it. Can you hear me? That, oh, you, yeah, you want to put that on? That's fine. Yeah, that'd be great. So, uh, Susanna um, Muspratt, you know, state your Name and address, please. Susanna Mosprat, uh, 38 North Prospect Street in Amherst. I have two general comments. Uh, the first one is that I know you have closed the public hearing on several of the issues on the agenda, but there ha have been some significant changes to the uh, the language that's being proposed since the public hearing ended. And so I hope you will allow further public comment tonight on those issues. The second is that um, 
when it comes to the apartments discussion, I would ask that um, Maureen provide an analysis of the impact of this change in the two BL districts downtown. She studied the impacts in a lot of other parts of town and completely ignored those two districts, uh, which we're very interested in. Um, and I'd like to see it both with the current zoning and with the proposed new zoning for those BLs. Thank you. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. Um, next we have Hilda Greenbaum. State your name and address, please. Hilda Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road. And I would like to be able to comment on both parking and the apartments when that moment arises. Um, I guess I had something else on my mind now. I can't remember what it was. I'll think of it in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Hilda. Uh, Pam Rooney, state your name and address, please. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, Ms. Muspratt took the words out of my mouth. I, I think we have um, accumulated a number of uh, wording changes and graphic cha changes and analysis that has been provided to both um, the CRC and now to the planning board um, after the fact, uh, after the public hearing closed. And hopefully you will uh, allow public comment to take place since you've essentially got new material to discuss. Uh, secondly, Ms. Muspratt covered my second topic, which was why the heck that we have the BL uh, um, analysis for North Pleasant Street and Triangle Street. Uh, thank you. I look forward to those conversations. Thank you, Pam. Um, so Chris, what, what, what's, what's your opinion? Uh, you know, we have closed the public hearings. Uh, there have been changes. What's the protocol in this in this situation? Well, the the planning board can decide whether it wants to take public comment or not. You've closed the public hearing, so you're not obliged to take public comment because we're not in the public comment period anymore. We're in the um, discussion, deliber deliberation, and voting period. But um, if you feel that the changes have been um, significant enough that you want to hear more public comment. Um, you can decide that. You don't have to decide right now. You can wait and see what the changes are. Um, I think that you've received the changes either in your packets or um, via email since um, the last since last week. And it may be that after you see what the if, after you kind of confront the nature of the changes that you'll have a better opinion about whether you want to take public comment or not. So that's what I would say is wait until you have kind of an assessment of what the changes are. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Uh, Janet, you have your hand up. Is taking public comment during the deliberation period of the planning board on a zoning amendment different from reopening the public hearing, um, which I think we were talking about at the last meeting. Is there a difference between those two? And um, of course, I'm in favor of the public comment. I feel like this has been a quick process and I'm always interested in hearing from the community. Chris. Answer. Yeah, so um, if you were to reopen the public hearing, you would have to re-advertise it. Um, and I don't think you're planning to do that. So it's at the discretion of the planning board and the planning board's okay. chair as to whether um, you all want to take more public comment. You're not obliged to. Okay. Very good. Um, all right, so um, next item. I can't hear. Jack's muted. I can't hear. I can't hear either. I, what happened? I, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's I, weird. I, uh, I uh, unmuted myself. All right, uh, but I was wondering, are there opening comments uh, that you gave me? I don't, again, there's been a lot of files for this, for this session. 
uh, yes, Chris. yes, Jack. It was with your um, opening comments. I scanned them all together into one document. Oh, there it is. Uh, I think. Yes, got it. All right, thank you. All right, so we're noting the time at 6.44. This was scheduled for 6.35, so we're good to go. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-03, Amherst College Wayfinding Sign System, various locations. Request uh, site plan uh, site plan review approval under Article Eight of the Zoning Bylaw of a complete wayfinding environmental sign design package to be located at multiple addresses on and off the Amherst College campus, including 155 South Pleasant Street, 101 South Pleasant Street, 129 South Pleasant Street, location on Spring Street. Uh, 46 Boltwood Avenue, 140 College Street, 22 Hitchcock Road, uh, 22 Snell Street, and 14 Hitchcock Road. So are there any board member disclosures on this? I see none. All right. Um, and we would ask Amherst College to present this. Jack, may uh, I make some remarks to say? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you, you'd ask that. Yes, Thanks. Chris. Yeah. So um, good evening. I'm Chris Brestra, Planning Director, and I wanted to just um, give some remarks to put this project in context. Amherst, Amherst College is proposing to install a wayfinding sign system throughout their campus and elsewhere. Um, and there are three places where the signs are being proposed. And I'm sure Tom Davies will go into this in more detail later. But the three places are in the ED Educational Zoning District on the Amherst College campus. Amherst College is presenting a general overview, overview of the sign system to the planning board. And this will uh, satisfy the requirement in section 3.211 of the zoning bylaw, which requires that proponents of projects within the ED zoning district submit plans to the planning board prior to installation. Uh, the second part of their um, sign project is signs in the town right of way. And these include areas along town streets and the town common. These signs are being reviewed by town council which has referred the signs to the TSO, Town Services and Outreach Committee. And the TSO has re referred them to the Design Review Board and Historical Commission, which have both submitted comments to the TSO. And the TSO will be reporting back to Town Council prior to its vote in a few weeks. And the third um, type of sign, or this the third location of signs for Amherst College is on private property owned by Amherst College, which is not in the ED zoning district. And these signs are generally located in the general residence district with one or two signs proposed in other districts. And these signs fall into two categories. Signs that meet the zoning requirements as to height, size, and number of signs on a single property. And I think Seth did a very good job of um, sort of outlining this in the big chart that he sent you. Um, but there are also signs that need a waiver and the waiver is under uh, is being requested under section 8.5 of the zoning bylaw. And they're asking for waivers for height, size and number of signs on a single property. Um, Article eight of the zoning bylaw contains a section for modification and waivers. And it says that any section or subsection of Article 8, which is the sign regulations, may be waived or modified by the permit granting board or special permit granting authority authorized to act under the applicable section of the bylaw for compelling reasons of public convenience, public safety, aesthetics, or site design. So Amherst College is coming to the board to obtain wa waivers and modifications for the signs that I sent recently, I listed all the signs and I sent a copy of that list to Amherst College and to the planning board members, as well as to Pam, if she's able to um, pull that up or we need to pull that up. Of course, Amherst College had sent us their own 
list of signs, but it was sort of embedded in a larger list. So I thought it might be helpful to pull out the actual signs that we're asking the planning board to review. So thank you very much. And I'll um, turn this back to um, Tom Davies now. Thank you. So uh, Chris, th th that's an email you sent what? At, at, at... I sent it at about 6.15 tonight, I think. But anyway, it okay, does I, Yeah, I have 5.50. Oh, okay. It All right, I have a, nine oh, locations and the number of signs and the types of signs that are being um, examined here tonight, just to kind of narrow your focus onto exactly what you're being asked to do. And mm. you don't necessarily need to refer to this list tonight, but it may be helpful at, from time to time to refer to it. And I also provided you a set of maps which show at a large, a larger scale where these different, where my understanding of these different signs is located. And that also may be helpful, but I'm sure Emerson College also has um, that in their presentation. So it's available if you need to look at it or want to look at it, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So Tom. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Um, and thanks for persevering through what is a far more complex process than I think any of us would have ever guessed. Um, and Chris and her other colleagues at the town have been terrific in, in helping to guide us through this. Um, <clears throat> I will, I will um, make a couple of introductory comments and then we'll, we'll kind of run through all this with our um, uh, our folks here, we have Andrew Baresi from uh, Roll Baresi, who is our um, wayfinding and signage uh, consultant and designer. And um, Seth, you mentioned earlier, has been really uh, spearheading the effort to try to figure this thing out and, and shepherd it through the multiple presentations and reviews and processes and trying to just keep everything figured out. Um, so um, I wanna provide a little bit of context in that, um, although I probably don't even have to say this, but most campuses have some kind of uh, campus identification and wayfinding. Um, it's something that has been lacking at Amherst College, um, but the, the, uh, the primary motivation uh, for this is our, our president and trustees um, uh, wanted to convey the, um, the welcoming and the inclusion that is at the core of the college, that, uh, that you know, we, we go way, way, way across the globe to attract um, and, and bring uh, families and students from all kinds of diverse backgrounds and different economic um, circumstances to the college, and then when they get there, they can't tell where the college is or where to go. It's it's you know not terribly uh, welcoming. So that's really at the core of what this is about. Um, the um, the second kind of just general comment that I'll make is that largely what we're talking about here are um, what I will um, maybe uh, uh, some people may disagree, but but. We're, we're talking about technicalities largely uh, related to the fact that much of our campus um, for historic reasons is not in ED zone. Um, we have uh, significant chunks of the campus that are in the general residence um, and uh, just having, you know, and multiple dormitories, for example, on one property. So once you have a sign in front of each building, you know, that's more than one and therefore we need a a special permit for, or a, a, a waiver for that. So um, we'll be running through all that stuff. And um, I guess uh, <clears throat> we'll just start uh, running through it. And um, uh, I guess what I wanna, what I'm, what I'm wondering out loud is if at some point you might say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's skip ahead and, and get to the next piece because there's a lot to it. So um, with that as a, um, kind of a vague introduction. Um, why don't I hand it over to Andrew and um, he can step us through these different pieces to it. I can, Thank you. Can everybody see my see what's up on my screen here? Yes. Okay. So what we what I have here is um, the package that was sent to you some time ago. Um, essentially intact, but what we've done is to 
make slight modifications to the illustration so it's clear. So for example, we've faded out the signs that are not in your purview and highlighted the ones that are, so it's a little clearer what we're talking about. Um, we've augmented some of the sign elevations with little inset maps that show you where they're located. So again, it's just easier to walk you through it, but essentially it's the same information that, that was sent to you before. Um, <clears throat> and as Tom said, we've been, I think it's about uh, eight, 18 months now, maybe a little longer, that we've been developing this comprehensive plan with Amherst College to sort of complete that last leg of a, of a prospective student's journey or a first-time visitor's journey, uh, which is getting you hopefully to the right place to put your car and get out of your car, orient yourself on foot and be on your way to where it is you're going. And you're going to see that the signage that we've developed is really speaking primarily to first time visitors and is addressing those destinations that are predominantly those, those um, more public first time visitor destinations. So we're not, we're not referring to everything on a sign. It's things like the museums and athletics and of course admissions, those kinds of destinations and parking. <clears throat> and what we've done is to create a system that is, uh, has mul multiple parts. This first part you're seeing here is that welcome statement that Tom mentioned. Okay, so gateways to the campus, um, both primary gateways such as at the intersection of South Pleasant and College, um, and also down near the entrance to admissions and athletics, and secondary gateways such as on East Drive and the entrance at, at uh, Quadrangle. Uh, and then it, at various uh, uh, locations, uh, on the outer routes, uh, some small trailblazer signs that, that hopefully get you to these, to these uh, gateway moments. Um, the other sign types are for vehicular wayfinding. So directional signs like you see here on the left, both larger and smaller. The smaller ones are principally on the campus. There's very few of them, um, but they're helping very importantly to get visitors to accessible parking locations, for example. And then we want to be sure that when you've arrived at a building, it's clearly identified. Um, so the Mead Art Museum, for example, or Pratt Field Admission Center, again, those high first time visitor destinations, uh, smaller, lower profile ones uh, for those buildings that um, you're approaching uh, sort of face on as opposed to from a distance. Uh, and then very importantly, uh, parking. We want to be sure that those principal parking lots for visitors are clearly identified as Amherst College lots. So those parking identification signs are part of the overall kit of parts that are consistent with the design uh, that you're seeing elsewhere. And then secondary lots uh, that are more sort of private kind of lots uh, have a smaller identification sign. Then finally, pedestrian wayfinding. So we want to you know, celebrate those museums, the performance halls, the theaters uh, with banners on campus. And then, as I said, when you get out of your car, have a orientation map there for you. And we have a few different kinds, depending on the location and application. We have a, a three-sided kiosk, which also combines posters of coming events and those kinds of things. Um, we have a double-sided sign for most parking lots. It's upright, so it's right there and you can see it right when you get out of your car. And on the other side, when you're returning to your car, perhaps there's a poster about what's going on at the museums and music um, a performance center and theater so that you know, you're encouraged to come back and visit as well. And then finally, the lower profile one, which is like a tabletop uh, for interior in the campus, uh, where we really don't want to block your view to those things that uh, you're looking for. And then while not a trail of breadcrumbs, we do have periodic small scale pedestrian directional signs at those key decision points where you need just a little bit of encouragement. Um, so we provide some directional signs for pedestrians there. Um, as far as the design rationale for what you're seeing, we're really trying to keep things um, as small scale as possible, though still being legible. Um, 
all the signs have a very dark background, um, such as this very dark aubergine color, which is consistent with the college's identity, but verging on a black. Um, so it's, there's a hint of it there, but it's a very dark panel. And the reason we're doing that is so that the signage can recede into the landscape. It doesn't really scream at you. Uh, we're using charcoal gray posts, which is reminiscent of the granite material you see in the landscape and in buildings around campus. Um, and finally, all the information is uh, white on that dark background, so it's very legible. So the information is there that you can clearly see. The signage isn't playing a starring role. Um, and, uh, and we're using materials that are consistent with what you see on campus, particularly in the case of these maps where we're using granite bases, uh, in some cases reclaimed granite from previous projects uh, that, that is still stored on campus, um, but all very consistent uh, with what you're seeing on the campus. Um, we're showing you these examples that we sent to you previously. Uh, these gateways are not necessarily, um, th these aren't signs that are, are you know, in the discussion tonight, but we think it gives you a more comprehensive uh, understanding of the overall program. This is at East Drive where we said we have a gateway um, and we're doing landscape improvements along with the signage that you can see here um, with granite seating walls and retaining walls, new plantings that are native uh, and um, uh, smaller scale trees as a backdrop, uh, really trying to improve the overall sense of welcome, not just with the sign, but with the landscape as well. Um, East Drive being an important entrance, but we feel as a secondary entrance. So we have this upright uh, tavern style sign here. Uh, and you can see different views of it. It's a double-sided sign. So we're getting people coming and going along College uh, Street. Andrew, I, I hate to interrupt you, but is that where the bus stop is? Um... Trying to get oriented. So this is this is East Drive right here, and this is College Street right here. Uh, you can go back to the plan. So again, College Street and down East by Street. the railroad, the railroad yeah. uh, bridge. The railroad bridge is right. Oh, it's further down. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At the corner of College Street, running this way. And South Pleasant Street. This is at the the, um, the four-way intersection. We have a, a primary gateway which wraps the curved corner here like this, set back, uh, and we're making a proposed sidewalk and landscape improvements here as well. And you can see in the design here with the granite seating wall here, so that people, if they're waiting at the light, can uh, can sit. Uh, it's also designed in such a way that you can sort of see through it. It's not a big wall. Um, it has a sort of a transparent quality to it while also um, having, of course, um, a sufficient scale to be read from across the wide intersection, um, but opens up the view uh, to the landscape or doesn't obstruct it, I should say. A similar type of gateway here along with similar landscape improvements um, at the entrance to the athletic center area and admissions um, where you can see we're, we're, we're realigning the, the walkway through the landscape and a similar style gateway here with the granite seating wall and the signage with dimensional letters. Now, this is the comprehensive program you're seeing here and that was in your packet. Um, not all of these signs, of course, are what we're reviewing tonight, uh, but it gives you a sense of, uh, of the, the total scope of the program uh, and the various different kinds of sign types in their locations. And we've taken that and it's superimposed over your zoning plans here. And, um, and we have details of each one of these um, sections of the map. Uh, not again, all of these sections do not have signs under your, your consideration, uh, such as here. But uh, in this location here, uh, this is Main Street, 
And this is South Pleasant Street here. We did have a trailblazer sign here, but through our coordination with the town sign program that we've been doing these past few weeks, we've been able to eliminate that sign. But here on Spring Street is the entrance to our alumni lot. Okay, that's an important visitor oriented parking lot. And we wanna be sure that's clearly identified with a parking ID sign. And we have elevations, as you know, in the packet of each one of these locations that we're asking you to consider. So D1004 is one of those. Here we have to orient you Route 9, College Street and 116 South Pleasant Street. And here at 79 South Pleasant where the uh, building that houses the human resources is located, it's very important that we identify that with an Amherst sign because it does get outside visitors. Uh, so we have C1004 on that parcel, as well as a, a three-sided kiosk at that location. And then um, we have a small scale parking identification sign on that parcel as well. Uh, so we have three on that one parcel, hence the request uh, for the waiver there. On this parcel down here. Excuse me, may I say something? Yeah. Um, Sorry to interrupt, but I think that the actual address of the signs that you just talked about, the F1002 and the C1004 are actually on the adjacent parcel. They're not actually on the parcel that has 79 South Pleasant. Just, I wanted to clarify that for the planning board members who have lists of all of these signs. So those signs are actually on, um, what is that? I think that is 101 South, Ple South Pleasant Street and it's a dormitory building. So the signs that Andrew just spoke about lead you to the, um, the building at 79 South Pleasant, but they're actually on the adjacent property. That's what I wanted to say. I'm sorry for not clarifying that. That's correct. Here uh, is a vehicular directional sign. B 1-005, which is directing folks, oh, I'm sorry. Which is directing folks to admissions right and the a museum and, and visitor parking straight ahead. We've been coordinating with the town sign program, as I said before. Uh, so there's no redundancies in the messages that the town sign uh, system is, is, is carrying and, and what ours are carrying. We're also coordinating with them to refine you know, the spacing between the signs so there's no conflict there. Uh, this small parking area is also identified on that parcel um, uh, with a small parking sign D2004. And finally, uh, further support for Alumni House. Um, we have um, a identification sign for Alumni House as well as a, another three-sided kiosk at that location here. Um, and there is a small pedestrian directional sign so that when you've parked at the alumni lot and you're making your way, um, you've oriented at that kiosk. And as I said, make your way down the path. There's a little bit of encouragement there with a small pedestrian directional sign, helping you to get on your way to the main part of campus. Here on Hitchcock Road, we have a, a building identification sign, a small scale one, um, C2-003. I believe that's Smith House. Um, and <clears throat> off of South Pleasant Street, C2005 for, um, I think that Scott House. And, and this is um, um, Pontypool as well. So just small building identification signs for those uh, buildings on, on those two parcels there. And a parking identification sign, the second one for the alumni lot on Sealy, because some folks approach, come off of college and go up Sealy here to enter that lot as well. Uh, 
Uh, and so we've singled out elevations for those signs we're asking you to consider. This was part of the um, uh, number of signs we were looking at, but in our meetings with uh, the uh, Design Review Board and the Historic Commission, uh, and of course TSO, um, that sign has moved out of uh, its original location and is uh, located um, off of uh, South Pleasant uh, just prior to um, Billbrook. I can't, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always misplacing the name of that, that small street. Um, uh, because of a conflict with the town directional sign at that location as well. So again, we're trying, we, we're, we're trying to accommodate and coordinate with the town sign system as much as we can and make modifications um, where possible. But that is no okay. longer a sign that we're asking you to look at. Uh, for what it's worth, I think that's Walnut Street there. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up still. You're muted. I didn't mean to have my hand up, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, there is, uh, this is that uh, directional sign that I mentioned on Northampton Road leading up to the intersection. As I said, talking about admissions and athletics and straight ahead for the Amherst College Museums and visitor parking. Um, we've modified this message so there's no redundancy with what the town system is asking for. Again, these are painted steel posts, charcoal gray with a black bracket um, that holds uh, the dark aubergine panel with reflective white lettering. Identification signs for alumni house here and for uh, South, I mean, the 79 South Pleasant offices here. These are the smaller scale signs um, uh, for Smith House, off of Hitchcock, uh, Scott House, and Pontypool as well. And parking lot identification signs. Here we have an opportunity to give permit information when, and when you can and can't park there as well uh, with regard to overnight parking. So we're doing that for uh, the alumni lot at the entrance off of Spring and at the entrance off of Sealy. And the smaller scale ones for the secondary lots um, here at Hitchcock Hall, uh, Sealy Hall, and uh, College of Morgan Halls. This is the three-sided kiosk with the granite base and the a locked display case that houses digital prints, um, which will be backlit. So inside there'll be illumination, but it's just to um, provide lighting at night for those translucent prints that will be in the case. Uh, this is the one, there's one in front, um, in, in, in the lot adjacent to 79 South Pleasant, as well as adjacent to the alumni. and the two-sided style here at the Dickinson lot as well uh, near East Drive. And here's that small pedestrian directional sign I mentioned from your path from Alumni House uh, to the King. It's, uh, again, talking about those key first time visitor buildings like uh, the Music Bill, Arms Music Building, Converse Hall, where there's often conferences um, Mead Art Museum, the chapel, of course, and the two theaters. Uh, and this is the comprehensive list of the, the signs that um, we are asking you to consider. So is there anything that you'd like us to circle back to or have any questions about? Well, um, I believe you know, we have a, we had a, a site, site walk here. Um, 
someone from um like to make a report on that i think tom maria andrew tom okay tom uh you want to you know go All over right, i'll do it i'll do it uh, <laughs> um <clears throat> I got there a couple minutes late, so I thought maybe these guys would, you know, cover for me. But um, so um, we we basically went to the alumni lot and we had um, both the plan and uh, the signage package um, available to us. So um, we were able to cross reference different locations with the signs and their actual scale. Um, Chris was there and um, illustrated for us, uh, uh, as she did today. Um, uh, why we're looking at certain signs. Um, there are more than uh, we would typically allow by zoning within this particular site, or this one is too tall, or this one is too much square footage and so on. So we were able to have some clarity about why we're looking at the different signs, um, which was super helpful. Um, and when we started in the alumni lot, we were able to move through a collection of at least four different locations right within that particular site where we were able to see um, where we would have uh, the information um, uh, kiosk that we see here, as well as a smaller sign and one of the taller uh, parking signs as well. So we were able to kind of see where all of those different sign types, um, actually even a ped small pedestrian sign, yeah. so we were able to see where those would all be within that location. So we can get a sense of the scale and proportion and how it would sit in the landscape, which was really helpful. Um, and then as a group, we moved, um, from the alumni lot um, out to Boltwood Ave and across the common, and we're able to look at um, the, the site for uh, along Sealy House and along South Pleasant and look at a few other locations. Again, just to get a sense of the flavor and the scale of these signs and how they be positioned within that landscape. Um, we had a, uh, a scale question as to what these taller signs at 12 feet might look like um in context and at one point um i was used as a puppet and ran across the street to stand next to a um a state highway sign and we could gauge the height of that sign based on my height so everyone would know what 12 feet looked like on uh 116 to someone driving by so we had a sense of scale within that context as well for the tallest sign that was um, on that list um, and then from there, we kind of regrouped about what signs were around and individually went off and visited those signs separately, um, just so we didn't have to walk all the way around the neighborhood, but we had the flavor, we had the signage package and we were able to see those um, visit the other sites as well. Um, and I think that pretty much covers uh, what, we, what we had um, discussed, but anyone else can, can chime in and give us a flavor um, um, to support that. Who, who was at the site? Um, I was myself, Andrew, Maria, and Chris. Okay. Andrew or uh, Maria, you went? That was a perfect yeah. job. Okay. Yeah, we, we measured in units of, of Tom for height. So some signs were two Toms tall and one were just like one Tom tall. Uh, 1.5 Toms. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is, is this, it, uh, I'm just wondering uh, for the folks that did this, is this, um, can we kind of like um, review this as one package or do you feel like it needs to be divvied up or, cause it is quite expansive, you know, you, you know, normally we're looking at one sign and here we're looking at, you know, a couple dozen. Um, just wondering, you know, what, what your feelings were on that Tom and, and then Andrew. Sure. I mean, my, my sense was that we were looking at a package and we're gauging how it would fit into our landscape. And I think it would be a challenge to go through each one and say, you know, this one's oversized by two square feet in this dimension, or this one is too tall. I think we were looking for the moments where we found something that might be offensive or obtrusive or break with the consistency of Amherst landscape. And I think at least the, the way I approached it, what I, I was looking for the anomaly. I was looking for that which might be a problem. Um, so I approached it that way. So I don't necessarily, I think we could probably bring up if we think there was something uh, that we wanna draw attention to, but I think we can imagine it as a package 
that would need to be approved from my perspective without necessarily having to go sign by sign. Okay, uh, Andrew? <clears throat> totally agree with Tom and I think just Andrew's presentation helped um, help us understand the intent of some of the heights of these. Um, you know, as we walk the placements, I think there is certainly nothing that was even remotely obnoxious or concerning. Um, I, I would agree that we could look at them as a single package. Very good, thank you. Um, so that's the site visit report. Uh, and I could just open up to the board at this point. Um, I see Doug. Yeah, I had uh, three, three questions. And I guess one is directly related to the graphics and the sign design and the other two are more peripheral, but related, I guess. So the first question was about the building signs where you listed a date under them. Um, and I can assume, I guess, that the typical date is the date of completion of the building if Amherst College built it. I'm just curious if, if it's a building that you purchased, what date do you use? Uh, they're consistent in that they are the date of the original construction. So for example, 79 South Pleasant that Andrew just pulled up here, uh, we purchased in uh, 2005 ish. Okay. Um, All right. And yet, you know, we're, we're, we're calling it 1834. Okay. And then um, I noticed on the town engineer's letter that he uh, said we need that this uh, should include the replacement of the failing brick and granite sidewalks on South Pleasant Street. And Tom, when, when you were here before us earlier this year, you know, you sort of tried to be as diplomatic as you could that Amherst College had put those in and the town was obligated to maintain those. Um, it seems like there's some sort of disconnect between the town and, and your uh, college. Uh, so I wondered, maybe Chris could advise us on how we kind of address that comment from the engineer. May I? Yes, Chris. So I think that the town engineer um, was commenting on um, the sign project in general. And I think his comments really related more to the um, sidewalk that is being proposed um, around the corner of, what is that? Um, the entry drive into the athletic center and South Pleasant Street. Um, and that's not one of the things that the town uh, that the planning board is reviewing. That's one of the things the town council is reviewing. So I would say as far as um, the planning board's review of this project, that issues related to crosswalks are not relevant. Um, and there is a sort of continuing dialogue between the town and the college about um, those crosswalks. But as I said, it's not part of the planning board um, okay. review process. So, so then the last comment, um, I think was more something that it makes me kind of makes me wonder whether we on the planning board ought to be thinking more about since a lot of these reviews are because we have Amherst College buildings that are not in the ED zone. Um, you know, should we be thinking about redefining, you know, expanding the ED zone to be more reflective of the current uh, boundaries of any, any of our higher institution, uh, higher education institutions in town. Um, you know, I know Amherst College and, you know, they all probably buy and sell property on a slow moving basis, but maybe we, it's been a little bit too long since we considered that. So uh, that's a comment, I guess, for Chris and maybe our agenda at some point in the future. It's certainly something to be considered. So we will put that on our list of things to talk about in the future. And Tom Davies has his hand up. Okay, Tom. I can, without question, uh, tell you that the college would wholeheartedly embrace that effort and um, would make all kinds of things about our lives easier. 
uh, in the future. So um, we, we would look forward to that conversation and can part, you know, participate however you, you all decide uh, is appropriate. So I assume that, that there's like some contiguous kind of, you know, uh, properties that could be um, readily identified is, is that fair or? Yeah, and a lot of the properties I think that would be in question, you know, don't have residential scaled, don't have residential buildings on them nor residentially scaled properties. So, you know, maybe not every property we own would be a candidate, I don't know, but certainly some of them, you know, haven't had residential properties in over a hundred years. So, you know, we could talk about this, the scale and proportion relative to their zoning district. Yeah. Okay. Um, and are there any other board? Um, oh, um, Doug, you have your hand up. Yes. Yeah, Doug? yeah, I, I, I guess I neglected to say I thought this was a really nice package. Um, you know, very uh, sensitive and, and the presentation to us was pretty complete. And, um, you know, everything looks tasteful from my perspective. Uh, I'm, ass I, I'm assuming I would call aubergine purple, but other than that, I don't have uh, too much to comment. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, thanks. I think it looks great. Yeah, I mean, it's some some of those, uh, you know, the ones with the Amherst College there that they, they, they don't exist, which is kind of surprising. So it'll be a, a welcome, you know, addition to to our premier sort of intersections downtown. I think, uh, Maria. I was just gonna say it looks more like eggplant to me, but I think yeah, <laughs> very uh, very tastefully done. And where we walked, it looked like it would just sort of blend in where appropriate and stand out where appropriate. But um, yeah, I think it's more of an eggplant. All right. Um, any other comments from the board? If not, uh, we can open up to public comment. Okay, see none. So we'll, let's uh, see if there's anything in um, public comment. Let's see, we have eight attendees. I see nothing. So, um, I don't know if the applicant, I, I don't feel like you really need to respond to anything, but you, you're welcome to tie up anything based on what you've heard. Okay, good, good. Um, and so someone, okay, Doug and then Andrew. Well, I thought at the beginning that Chris mentioned that she hadn't put together findings or conditions or anything for us to review. I guess the question would be, are, can we move this tonight or do we need to wait for those? That is correct. I, um, Chris, what do you? I think you can move it tonight and you can put on, um, you know, some basic findings like, or excuse me, basic um, conditions such as um, build I, it according. I can't hear Chris. Oh, you can't hear me? I'm sorry. Um, I was saying... I, I can't hear I'm, Chris. I'm not muted, am I? No, I hear you. I can hear you. I hear you. No, we can hear you. I, I hear you too. Okay. Um, so what I was saying is that um, you can put on some general conditions like you usually do, like build and install according to plan and manage according to the management plan. And if there are any changes. I can't hear Chris. Can other people hear me? I, I hear you. Yes. I, 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 can hear I think you. I hear you. Yeah. Janet, Janet can, can, can you hear, can you hear us? us? Janet, can you can hear you... anybody, Janet? I can't hear anything. Uh oh. She might be muted. I mean, her her volume on her computer might be muted. Yeah. So, Janet, you, do you hear me? No. Sure. Um, want to try chat? 
chats. I don't think we do chat. Um, okay. I have that capability. Someone want to text maybe her and have her like log off and back on? I, I just texted her. <clears throat> OK. All right, we'll just hold this up for a minute. Um, Yeah, okay, so I have uh, Andrew. Did you wanna? No, I'm okay. I'm fine. Okay. Let's wait a, a couple of minutes here for. Did Janet get your text, Andrew? She yeah, responds. she said she's going to exit and come back in. Okay. All right. We'll wait. Um, what time is it? We could take an early break. Um, she could also call in on her phone as well. Yeah. When she comes back, we should like just play a gag and like say we've wrapped up for the <laughs> night and see what she does. Looks like Janet's back. She's back. Janet, can you hear us? Can you suggest that she check her volume at the bottom of her computer? Will do. Thank you. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Okay. Janet, do you hear us? Do you hear me? Yes, I do now. I finally do. Okay. So, sorry. And do you hear Chris? Hello. I didn't hear anything Chris said, but I, I, I think that I left. I last heard um, about whether you were all going to wait for the the conditions. So. I could take a thumbnail of that. So what I said was that um, you don't necessarily have to wait for conditions. You can put conditions on tonight and you can make them the general ones that you usually apply, which are that um, the applicant shall build the whatever it is according to the plan that is presented and manage it according to the management plan that was presented. And that um, if there are any changes that they need to, any significant changes that they need to come back and show them to the planning board to uh, determine whether a new site plan review application is needed. And um, the significance of changes is usually determined by the building commissioner. Thank you, thank you. And then you can also, in terms of findings, um, have your general finding that um, this project meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. Very good. All right, so I see a number of hands up still. Uh, Andrew, Seth. Yeah, Jack, I was ready to make make that motion. Um, I couldn't track all of the recommendations you made, Chris, but certainly like the standard, uh, the standard ones would make sense to me. Uh, although as you were going through them, I think the first one or second one, wouldn't that already be implied anyway in our approval that they would be following the plan as presented or, or no? It is, but it makes it easier for the building commissioner to enforce it if you put it as a condition. Okay, well then I, if you don't mind sort of uh, regurgitating the standard conditions, I would like to make a motion to approve this. So the standard conditions are for something like this, that the applicant builds whatever it is according to the plan that has been presented and approved at the planning, by the planning board, that um, the entity manages what is going to be installed according to the management plan. And I must say in the manage management plan is fairly slim in this regard, but it's accurate and I saw it tonight. And then the other one is if there are significant changes to the proposal that um, they would bring back the changes to the planning board for uh, review and approval and a determination uh, as to whether the changes are significant enough to require a new site plan review. And then the second thing I said was that you could find that this project meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw. Okay, uh, and then, um... Okay, Seth's hands down, Tom, and then Doug. I'll second that. Okay, so um, so moved, 
with regard to what Chris has stated. Any further discussion? I see none. So we do a little roll call. Uh, Maria? Approved. And Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And myself was an aye. So that's 7 0. Closing the public hearing with the conditions that Chris mentioned. Thank you, Amherst College. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Have a good evening. All right, you too. All right, so it's 734, and now we're going on to uh, zoning amendments. And again, that we've, we've gotten a lot of info um, on this. And Chris, I, I don't know if you want to kind of give a preamble to where we are as we dive into the first one, which would be the zoning bylaw article three, use regulations, uh, section 3.2. 3.323 apartments and article 12 definitions um, discussion of vote on recommendation to the town council uh, to see if the town will vote to amend section 12 definitions of the zoning bylaw to revise the definition of, of apartments by removing the limit on the maximum number of dwelling units per building to amend section 3.323 to change the permitting requirement for apartments from special permit to site plan review for the residential village center uh, district and from site plan review to the special permit to the general business uh, district uh, and to modify requirements regarding the site bedroom uh, count of units to require that enclosed, enclosed parking on the first or ground floor be located at the rear of the building and designed to reduce visibility from the public way and require that the principles and standards of the design review board be applied to all new apartment buildings. So it's my understanding that this is this is um, it's been tweaked a little bit. Um, and Chris, I'm wondering if you can kind of. I'll give a general statement, that. and then Maureen uh, Pollock is here to um, talk about specifics. So okay. the general statement is. Um, three things have changed. One is we're no longer um, suggesting that you uh, allow apartments in the RVC zoning district by site plan review. We're um, reverting to special permit there. Um, there is a, a section that's been added having to do with um, location of apartments. And I'm gonna let Maureen explain that. And then Doug had a suggestion about wording under enclosed parking. So Maureen can, um, talk about that as well. So they're really just those three things. Just those three things. Okay, so Maureen. Oh, there you are. Oh, hi. Hi, hi everyone. <laughs> um, hold on a second. Okay, so I could, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, it's a little stack, staticky on my end for some reason. Um, so I could uh, share my screen to show you uh, the proposed uh, language and um, if folks want me to go through uh, the, sl the latest slides that I uh, provided, um, I believe the PowerPoint is dated uh, August 27th. Um, so I could go through that. So let me just pull up the, um, the proposal. Um, let's see here. So. Um, can everyone see the the draft language here? Yes. Okay. So just to recap, uh, so the the green bold al italics text is the proposed language, and the bold italics with green lettering and highlighted in yellow is uh, indicates the proposed language dated uh, August sixteenth. So that's the latest edition, and then the red strike through uh, in bold. Um, indicates uh, removal of the existing zoning bylaw. 
And so just to repeat, um, under Article 12 definitions, the, propo the proposal is to remove the, uh, the maximum amount of units in, a, in an apartment building, which is uh, currently maxed out at 24 units, and uh, we would be uh, proposing to remove that. Um, and um, as Chris had indicated um, earlier in this process, we had uh, proposed that in the uh, village center residence zoning district um, that it would be by um, site plan review. Um, we're redacting that and uh, agree that 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 should be by special permit. And we are still uh, proposing that uh, in the general business zoning district, it would uh, the proposal is to uh, allow it by special permit instead of the current, which is by site plan review. Um, this section just repeats about the removal of the cap of 24 units per building. Um, and so the latest revision um, is here um, highlighted in the green text in um, highlighted in yellow, um, which, which states uh, proposed apartment building located on any given parcel that fronts on to East Pleasant Street, North Pleasant Street, South Pleasant Street, Main Street, and Amity Street within the general business zoning district shall not be located within 500 feet of an existing apartment building. Uh, the distance under the section shall be measured in a straight line from the nearest point of the building in question to the nearest point of the building where the proposed apartment building is or will be located. Um, and, um, I could um, certainly show you uh, a few s slides um, that I provided to illustrate um, that proposal. Um, and then continuing on the original, um, uh, no changes to our other proposals, which uh, the bedroom count gets into um, how, uh, you know, apartment buildings with 10 or more units, uh, there would uh, have to be no more than 50% of the total number of dwelling units could have the same bedroom count. Um, we are getting um, rid of the management plan section largely just because it's redundant. It's a requirement under the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals Rules and Regulations and as part of the application uh, form itself. And as Chris indicated earlier, uh, we made a slight modification to the section about enclosed parking, uh, which um, is to say that enclosed parking would on the first or ground floor uh, located inside the building would need to be at the rear of the building and it would be de de uh, designed to minimize, um, that's the slight uh, modification, minimize the, um, the visibility from the public way or walkways in areas customarily used by pedestrians and the public. Um, oh, and this should be, uh, I guess, oh yeah, I guess that is in the um, existing language, but just as a reminder, um, in all dis zoning districts, the permit granting authority shall apply the provisions, uh, the design review principles and standards uh, for any new um, apartment building um, under this section. Um, and so it, it, it says uh, shall apply on um, those sections. Um, and so if you want, I could pull up, hold on a second. Um, so um, let's see here. So this is oops, this is um, the proposal uh, pertaining to the general business district. Um, again, um, you know, uh, the proposal is to say that uh, uh, apartment building located on our our main corridors uh, in the downtown in the BG zoning district shall not be located within 500 feet of an existing park uh, apartment building. Uh, we do know that there is a, a existing parking building um, located. Let's see here. I believe it's um, right next door to the Black Sheep. I think between the Black Sheep and where uh, Lone Wolf in the uh, in that sort of vicinity. Um, it's highlighted here in yellow. It's along Main Street. Um, it's a three-unit apartment building, um, and so the measurement would would start off of this because this is the existing parking. Uh, apartment building and uh, measuring, um, you know, 500 feet uh, an apartment building at, at um, could be located here at the minimal 
Um, so here, here, um, but only, you know, one, um, one could be located here. Um, and, and this sort of just sort of reflect, illustrates, um, this would be the maximum amount of apartment buildings that could be located uh, facing the, 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 the front of our, um, the main um, corridors in, in the BG district. Um, and um, so the proposal, in, um, and so we wanted uh, to be respectful of that. We want to encourage, you know, mixed use buildings along our main corridor, but we know that, uh, you know, we need to um, encourage population support for businesses along the main corridors as well. Um, and so we feel that a maximum of five apartment buildings that abut or face the, uh, the our main corridors would um, not hinder, um, you know, the streetscape of our main corridors. Um, and so you have um, that addresses the, 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 the section um, along the main corridors facing the street. The parcels uh, and with this, um, we could uh, allow that apartment building be behind, um, you know, behind the uh, a building facing facing the front the front here. So, for instance, um, you know, where I'm putting my mouse here, there could be a, a mixed use building set here. But um, if if there's enough, you know, lot area and all that, there could be an apartment building that's um, also existing on the same parcel, or um, you know the parcels back here, um, such as where the pub is or will be soon demolished, um, th that that parcel does not affront those main corridors. So an apartment building could be uh, set back there. Um, for instance, um, there are some existing apart apartment buildings back here. Those could remain. Um, and so the emphasis is that it's OK to have you know, apartments in, in the core downtown, but we don't want to have a prolification of apartment buildings, particularly on the main corridors where we do want to activate the streetscape and provide a vibrancy of, of mixed uses, such as office buildings and, and particularly retail and commercial and, you know, restaurants and, and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, we do, uh, you know, we do feel that that um, this mixture of different uses will help um, support a population for businesses um, and that housing within walking distance of downtown and our main streets is vital to the, to the success of downtown, especially outside of peak hours for retail shops, offices, cafes and restaurants and so on and so forth. So, Maureen, let, let me just stop you right there because I see a couple of hands up. Uh, Andrew, Doug, and then uh, I think Tom had his hand up as well um, on this BG district, I, I assume. So, Andrew? Thanks, Jack. Uh, thanks, Maureen. I just want to make sure I'm understanding this, this map correctly. The yellow squares are exit, like all five of those are no, existing uh, today? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, um, only this one that has this call out is existing. And so the measurement between, um, so the proposal is that if you want, if someone, if an applicant would like an apartment building along these main uh, streets that are listed here, um, they would have to be 500 feet from at least, at least 500 feet from one another. And so um, the measurement starts from an existing part apartment building. This is the only known apart existing part apartment building um, along these main corridors. And so the measurement um, from here straight out uh, would reach this sort of vicinity. Um, and this kind of gives you, in, in this way as well, this kind of gives you an indication where approximately uh, the next apartment building could be located. Um, if you measured out this way, it's just shy of 500 feet. So um, that wouldn't be possible. So um, th this is just to illustrate um, the maximum amount of apartment buildings that could be uh, located along these main streets. Okay, no, thanks for clarifying. So then the other, like I know there are other residential properties, they're just mixed use buildings, the one- Exactly, the yeah, exactly, yep. They're Very all good. mixed use, yep. Okay, thanks. 
Thank you, Andrew. Doug? So the way you have this worded, um, we can't build any apartment building on these streets if it's within 500 feet of any apartment building. So That's for instance, the hatched area you show on Amity Street, that's gonna be prohibited by the existence of the Perry apartment building. And the hatched area you show on Main Street near Churchill, that's gonna be prohibited by the elderly housing apartment building that's kind of across the street, across the park from that. So I think, you know, I think if your intention is that we're only trying to measure from apartment buildings that uh, front one of these streets and is within the BG district, we need to add that language to this proposed bylaw. Uh, 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 that's a point well taken, uh, Doug. Yeah, so the intention of this proposal is that uh, the measurement would be only applicable uh, for parcels um, that are highlighted in the sort of hatching um, as they are the parcels that up front of um, that front, um, you know, east, east, north and south Pleasant Street, Main Street and Amity Street. And so parcels that are in pink, if you will, um, those are not um, part of the measurement, it would only be um, measured um, within 500 uh, with um, within the sort of um, the, the, the measurement is only within the, um, the front part. Um, yeah, I just think the way you've got it worded, yeah. you know, we're gonna be measuring from any apartment building regardless of whether it fronts one of these main streets or and regardless of whether it's in the BG district. Okay, point well taken. We can certainly uh, take a, a closer look and see how this could be um, word, you know, reworded to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, more clear. Uh, and then Chris, I had, oh, I'm sorry, Doug. Well, I had uh, one other grammatical or uh, word choice edit, but I can come back to that later. Okay, Chrissy. I wanted to ask if we could come up with some wording now that would um, satisfy this issue. So what do we need to do? Add some words after the existing apartment building? Um, Let me pull up the, this is the official wording. Uh, the, the slideshow is sort of a, um, is sort of a, just a, um, a less technical. So it would be, shall not be located within 500 feet of an existing apartment building that is located in the BG zoning district. Is that what and and all and also fronts within the frontage the, the same streets. Yeah, it's, it has to mimic the exact same statement about East Pleasant, North Pleasant, South Pleasant. That yeah. Do you have a um, word version of this, Maureen? This oh, is a okay. word version. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see me? Um, making these modifications? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, would this be, um, how does this look? Uh, so um, an opposed, uh, a proposed apartment building located on any given parcel that fronts onto East Pleasant, North Pleasant, South Pleasant, Main Street and Amity Street within the general um, zoning district shall not be located within 500 feet of an existing apartment building that is also that is located with the general business zoning district. Uh, and, which, and, and oh, thank you, thank and you. Fronts and also, and, you know, and also, or, or maybe you. the also might go where you had it earlier, right after located. Oh, here you mean? Also. Yeah. Also, um, that is located also also within. Uh, okay, uh, that is located also within the BG zoning district and also fronts onto east, east, north, south, Pleasant Street, Main Street, and Amity Street. The distance under this section shall be measured 
in a straight line from the nearest point of the building in question to the nearest point of the building where the proposed apartment building is or will be located. Good work, Maureen. No, good work, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Chris, you, your hand is still up. I'm putting it down. Okay, Thank Janet you. and then Doug. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm not in favor of this, um, that, particularly that language, but it, you know, it seems to me two things will happen is that it will push um, apartment buildings, five-story apartment buildings sort of on the lesser streets that connect in. Um, and I counted at least one, Prey Street, Triangle Street, Lessie, Boltwood Walk, Kellogg, Halleck, Coles, Boltwood, I think I said Boltwood, and Churchill and Spring Streets. And so um, it could just push you know, very dense apartment buildings onto those streets, which of course are very close to um, residential neighborhoods. Um, but I, I, I'm kind of at a loss of why we're here because it seems to me that the downtown has had the remote, most robust development of residential unit units. Um, it's been able to do that with first floor businesses. And it seems to me by giving this option of sort of unlimited apartment units without anything on the first floor, um, it's just gonna push out all the benefits we see in mixed use buildings. And so it seems like we've gone from, you know, let's encourage um, more residential units downtown, but require um, and use, you know, with mixed use buildings when we're keeping our first floor businesses robust and you know there's a place for people to go and now there's people to go there to now we're just having apartment buildings and they could proliferate downtown um, pushing you know pushing out existing businesses or future businesses and on the streets that I mentioned that are sort of like I wouldn't call them side streets there's plenty of businesses on the ground floor um, you know it, I'm just looking at you know if you look at um, the bank center, you know, there's a really robust restaurant there um, whose name I just ate there. It completely eludes me. Um, there's a whole bunch of businesses there. There are businesses along Kellogg Avenue, um, the, the coffee house, um, you know, there's the channel strings. And so all of a sudden we're giving this incentive to build five-story buildings, all apartments, replacing existing businesses. And I don't know why we're there because this is the part of town that has seen the most residential development and permits. And so I just don't, I, I don't know why we're doing this at all. Um, and I think that, you know, if you want to see some more apartment buildings, um, maybe you want to see some condo buildings where people live um, year round and not just student housing, maybe you could lift the cap from 24 to like 40 um, or something like that. But I, I just don't understand the purpose of this. It seems like it's undermining the downtown as fundamentally a place for business. And we have tons of buildings that could be torn down that have three stories, four, you know, three stories of businesses right now. And also it's all gonna be apartments. And so what is that gonna look like? What's the impact on the downtown, the existing businesses, um, the future growth of businesses in the area? Thank you, Janet. Um, Doug and then Andrew. Yeah, I get a couple of things. Um, I guess, it, uh, you know, it seems to me we're here, at least looking at the slide we're looking at and talking about the BG zone, because there was concern that the original proposal, which did not include this special provision for BG, might, in fact, result in, a, in more a proliferation of apartment buildings. Now, I've never really shared that because we've now made it, made it so that apartment buildings are only allowed in BG with a special permit, which we have on the board, we have a perfect right to deny. It's not like a site plan review where we're just trying to tweak something that, that is uh, allowed essentially as of right. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a complete authority by us to allow or reject a proposal to put an apartment building in the BG district. So, you know, I don't even think we need this 500 foot language and, but, you know, if people are concerned about that, that's fine. Um, so then my second comment was, uh, if we go back, 
I mean, are we talking about the, the overall proposal at the moment or are we listed limited to the BG? I was gonna mention my one edit on the language that was is proposed for the for the bylaw. If you continue down, uh, Maureen, get to the bottom of the page. Whoops. Um, nope, go go up. Bottom of yeah, there. Okay. Bedroom count, the end of the second line. Um, less should should be fewer. Oh, thank you. Um, you. We use fewer when it's something being counted. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Very good. Uh, so we have Andrew and then Janet and Maria. Thanks, Jack. I, I would I would just say to to both Janet and Doug, I think yes, right. I mean, I think. Ultimately, we want to um, <clears throat> prevent the apartment, the apartments from being built downtown. We want to make sure we've got the vib vibrant ground floor. So, uh, I agree, Janet, with you that it you you could say that maybe this shouldn't even be in the conversation because uh, we don't want any of these. But then I also think uh, Doug makes a great point that we don't have to have any of these if we don't want to. Um, so it seems like there's a mechanism in here to prevent apartments from being proliferated. Um, but I, I do just want to thank both of you for calling that out because I think that's really a, a critical point as we think about this in the, in the development of downtown. Thank you, Andrew. Janet, and then Maria. So I don't know of any instance where the planning board has turned down a special permit. So I don't, I don't see the special permit is this really rough road that is tough to overcome. I just think that we need to make a decision, assume that any special permit that comes through, you know, might be modified, you know, occasionally modified. I haven't seen that much in my two years here either. Um, and so I think that we should realize that, you know, opening the doors to unlimited number of units in apartment buildings will lead to many more apartment buildings. And we know that the property owners want that. And we know that um, we know that, you know, from what we hear from the property owners, I'm not sure we haven't heard from the small businesses in these conversations, but we know that the property owners want less and less ground floor retail business professional. And I think we're, you know, 40% first floor business is the minimum of, of all the towns that we looked at. And now we're going to zero and it's a small downtown. We need to keep it open for businesses and people are going to shut businesses along Kellogg Avenue, along, you know, Prey Street, which has, you know, a little sort of backdoor businesses. Um, you know, they could be taller buildings. They could be more robust um, with more apartment buildings, but they're not going to be here if we're opening this door. And I think that it's a fantasy to think that we're going to turn it down because I, I haven't seen the planning board do that. And so I think we need to look at this with hard heads and just say, okay, 10 years in the future, what happens when all, you know, there's like six apartment buildings downtown and we've lost, you know, a few, you know, thousands of dollars of thousands of square feet of business space because it's so lucrative to have apartments, but it's so lucrative to have apartments. That's how we get our first floor retail in and vibrancy and small shops and a place for people to, you know, start and grow and, you know, really a functioning downtown that I see in other, you know, I see it in Burlington, I see it in Northampton, I see it, I mean, I see it in lots of places, but the downtown is filled with first floor retail. Arlington is the same way, where I just was, um, you know, North Cambridge. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Chris, and then Maria, and then Tom. Maureen has her actual hand up too. And oh. I just, I just wanted to offer the fact that this is a special permit for use, and um, the SP indicates that it would be by the Zoning Board of Appeals, so it wouldn't actually be a special permit from the Planning Board. It would be a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Maria, and then Tom. Yeah, I was going to say, this is special permits are not planning board, so we wouldn't be reviewing it. Um, I actually want to backtrack a little, kind of on the same theme of this is, um, Maureen, could you tell me why, what what happened with the SPR getting changed to SP for RVC for Residential Village Center? I, I Maybe I missed some meetings, but 
was that just out of the blue or did that already happen? Maybe I missed the meeting. I'm like, <laughs> uh, I, I think this might be the first planning board meeting that this has been m mentioned. Um, okay. There was um, a lot of um, concerns about um, making um, it by site plan review um, from member um, in the RVC by members of the public and from um, board members. Um, and so we uh, felt that it would it would be okay to keep it by special permit. Um, and um, and so we were uh, and it seemed to make sense. So we we, we decided to. Um, just to, to keep it as is by special permit. And um, just to clarify, if I may, um, so in the almost four years that I've worked with the town of Amherst, uh, I am the staff liaison to the zoning board of appeals. And while the, in my almost uh, four years here, uh, the, z the zoning board of appeals hasn't denied a special permit, um, but what af often happens or not often when it does happen, which has uh, a growing list of, of examples is that when the board has issues with projects and feels that they cannot make findings um, to approve a project and indicate that during the public hearing process, the applicant has uh, requested to withdraw without prejudice uh, because the applicant knows that the board is most likely going to ultimately deny the application. Um, and so that gives that applicant a chance to, uh, you know, to, uh, to go back to the drawing uh, board and rethink the, the proposal and, um, and then weigh out whether they want to resubmit um, uh, an application with all the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, comments and concerns raised in the public hearing process, as well as members of the public that um, had um, been uh, actively engaging in, in that public comment period um, each time. So there is definitely a handful of, um, of these examples that uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals um, has um, dealt with. Additionally, um, the Zoning Board of Appeals has, um, in my time, um, certainly pushed back on applicants to, re uh, to uh, lower the proposed building uh, height and, uh, and amount of floors. They've actually um, uh, additionally have uh, challenged developers to reduce the amount of uh, units in buildings as well. Um, so the Zoning Board of Appeals is, 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 is very comfortable to have um, these sorts of uh, discussions and negotiations during the public hearing process. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify that and give you the perspective of, of how public hearings are um, handled by uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Oh, uh, I, I, I didn't, sorry, I, I didn't get to. So thanks for that, yes. Maureen. But um, I, a reason why I brought up a, a why did the um, SPR change back to SP was I, I wanted to make sure it wasn't just, you know, a small handful of public comments or emails that suddenly switched this because I, I really am pushing more for increasing housing and that move from SP to SPR for RBC made perfect sense because that's the ideal place to build more housing, more housing where there's already density. And to switch back to RBC to special permit um, seems really counter to that. And I I just wanted to make sure it wasn't, you know, we, we get these handful of emails and I don't know if that that's the voice of the town. I don't know that that's the population speaking and I just want to make sure that we're not moving back from this big push that we're doing to increase housing increase more affordability increase our housing stock um I just thought that was a great step in the right direction and then to see that switch I thought oh I must have missed a meeting or something or some discussion so I was a little disappointed to see that switch from SPR to SP when I was you know it was like oh yay progress but um so that that was why I asked that question was just uh, was, was there a push from town council? Was there a CRC? Was it from the higher ups that, you know, said, uh, let's, let's drop that switch from SPR to SP? I don't know if anyone can answer that. <laughs> Chris or Maureen? 
Well, I can answer it. I think it was a, a recommendation on the part of staff to change back to what exists now. Um, that seemed to be a focus of attention of many of the commenters from the public. And it seemed that um, it would be um, potentially wise to drop that one thing in order to um, have this bylaw as a whole be more acceptable to people. And um, I think, you know, we're really focused on developing apartments in the downtown and village centers, yes, but, um, you know, I think BBC uh, can also be a, a focus of developing apartments. It doesn't have to be in the RVC, and RVC is close to farmland in some locations, so it just seemed like um, one uh, kind of thing that made people turn against this proposal. And if we could um, put that aside for now and maybe get back to it later, maybe that was a good strategy. Now, this is something that we're offering to you at this point, so the planning board can decide to change it back to, you know, if the planning board decides to keep the proposal to allow these apartments by our, by a site plan review in the RVC zone, that's something that would be your prerogative, but we're suggesting that it go back to being special permit. In other words, don't make a change to the RVC at this time, but you may wish to make a change in the future. Thanks, Chris. So Tom, uh, Doug, and then Janet. Tom? Sure, thanks, Jack. Um, so I, I'm trying to figure out if I'm, I'm reading this right, because I'm hearing that somehow this, um, this proposal is liberating people to build tons and tons of apartments downtown. And I'm reading over and over the current apartments description and trying to understand that um, if I wanted to, right now, people could build 50 24 unit apartments downtown on Main Street by right. Is that true? And if that's true, then doesn't this actually restrict it to only five? And even though it does give you more apartment units per building, restricts the number of buildings that are strictly apartments. So is that is it true that by right, I can put as many apartments buildings downtown as long as there's less than 24 units? Chris? Yes, it is. Maureen has studied this more carefully than I have though. So she may have some something to offer and I saw her raising her hand. Yeah, sorry, I can't raise, I don't have the raise your hand feature when I'm, when I share my screen. So you'll have to deal with my real hand. Okay. Uh, uh, so currently in the BG zone, it's uh, apartments are permitted by site plan review. Um, and, uh, and the current, you know, the, the bylaw says there could be no more than 24 units in, a, in an apartment building. And so um, that's, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, but yeah, I do so know I mean, the, the theory that I'm reading is that we could have a downtown that's all smaller apartment buildings and there's no limit on that right now because it's just by site plan review. And that what we're doing here is make, uh, switching this to an SP, we're limiting it, capping it to a distance and even though we are adding height, we're changing the way in which the downtown landscape could be developed. And so in my sense, my mind, it feels like a, a positive way to restrict the way in which apartment buildings are built downtown. And so that I'm reading it that way. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that this is a restriction on the proliferation of apartment buildings downtown rather than an allowance of them. Um, so right. I wanna make sure that language is clear um, as we, uh, as the public listens. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Tom. Well stated, Tom, thank you. Uh, Doug and then Janet. Yeah, I guess uh, just to put on two cents at the end of that conversation, I'd say we're now encouraging fewer larger apartment buildings in the BG. Um, but I, uh, I was going to say that I agree with Maria that uh, I am dismayed to have the RVC 
uh, go from site plan review to special permit. Uh, as I look at the chart that's at the bottom of the first page of this, um, I'm not seeing. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing any any site plan review anymore. Um, and um, you know, as long as we're kind of thinking about it in that sense, I wonder why we're not at site plan review for the BVC district. Um, you know, I mean, I think we we were hoping to encourage the construction of of apartment buildings that are not currently getting built because of the limitation on the number of units. So, you know, if we make them all, I mean, we just haven't done very much, I guess is what I'm kind of feeling at the moment. I would encourage us to at least go to site plan review on uh, BVC so that we can get a few decent sized apartment buildings in the village centers and start to build up the density of those areas as well, since clearly our, our downtown is too small. I also, I mean, it's, I mean, maybe it's a maybe it's a comment for another day, but the additional side and rear yards per floor. Um, I guess I just wanted to say it's not clear to me why we do that. Um, that uh, you know, as you put on stories, that really adds up and takes away from the utilization of parcels, which are precious in an area where we want density. So I maybe that's just something to talk about next time we want to think about this section. Thank so I, I just want to let, let people know that, you know, normally we have taken a break at eight, but we've, um, we would like to conclude this meeting at 930. So I, you know, I, I suspect everyone's okay was kind of pushing through, uh, you know, through this, but um, we, you know, we, we have, we're going to have to decide. Oh, and, and the other factor was whether we want to hear public comment on this. So that would be, um, you know, a choice on the board because again, the, the hearing has been closed. We're deliberating, and so those are a couple of things that, if anyone has an opinion on, I'd like to offer. So, uh, Janet. Um. So I, I think we need a mechanism to keep the incentives. For, towards mixed use buildings downtown. And so we don't wanna tilt it. I think this current draft tilts it too far towards apartments and we're gonna lose a lot of businesses downtown. Um, and actually maybe in the village centers, which are filled with businesses, like that's like the great thing about the village centers is like lots of little businesses to go. And so I'd be really interested in that. I, um, I also wanna just like offer up some facts is that you know, we had a housing production plan. We wanted to see like 850 housing units in five years. Um, and we, and those permit, and that happened, right? There's not, there's a lot of housing demand in Amherst. A lot of pit permits were issued. What didn't happen were, um, you know, low income housing and moderate really income housing rentals at all. And so um, we have very robust housing development in Amherst. I mean, you know, down on Southeast Street, we permitted, you know, the um, Southeast Street Commons, the North, um, North Amherst saw, I can always block the name of that um, 40R, 40B development. So those are a few hundred units. Um, University Drive had a, a thing built and then there's something being built now. Downtown has several things that are permitted that have yet to be built. So we are we are seeing with mixed use requirements, robust development of residential units. And so we're gonna look at the next five years. And the problem, the problem I see with this is that we are lacking strict design guidelines. We're not protecting our streetscape and historic buildings. And you know, I don't know how many people you need to sign a petition, but there's like at least 900, 1,000 people in this town who are on board with increasing density, but not in without design guidelines and some protection of the small town nature, all of which are master plan goals. So I really think we need a mechanism to, you know, keep businesses on the first floor. And so I don't, 
I just want to, um, so just, you know, so I, here's my question for Maureen is if, you know, with your current 500 and I understand the 500 foot thing is to try to keep um, people from tearing down buildings along the main streets and, you know, with all those businesses and replacing it with apartment buildings. I understand that. But even with your, um, your 500 foot thing, how many apartment buildings could go downtown, including the back of the lots or along the um, side streets? Because that, those are gonna be very tempting areas for development of apartment buildings with unrestricted unit counts. And so can you do that? And then, you know, what would be the difference between doing that and doing mixed use? I mean, I think, there, you know, eventually there'd be less residential units with mixed use, but you'd have the benefit of keeping businesses or having space for new businesses. So like, what's the maximum amount of apartment buildings that could go in under the scenario? And do you have a sense of the unit count of mixed use versus apartments? Maureen? Um, yes. Uh, so I did actually do um, an estimate of how many uh, parcels could uh, be provided um, that don't face one of the, the main corridors. And um, it would be approximately five or seven properties. And um, I can point to some of them. So, uh, you know, this property, sorry, let me make this bigger if this is helpful. Um, so, you know, the, the where the, the pub is situated um, in the adjacent property, uh, these two could potentially be an apartment bu building. Um, this back here could be an apartment building. Um, these, um, these could potentially, um, th I just, just so you know, like this hatching is just, this has no meaning in like, you know, a mixed use building probably would go further back here. Um, so, um, you know, this would be interesting to see if an apartment building could fit, fit here. Um, the leader building, uh, which I believe was demolished um, back here uh, could be an apartment building. Um, this is where the post office is located. Uh, there could be a, a, a smaller development back here along um, th the parcels uh, close to North Pleasant Street. Uh, a very tiny apartment building, um, less than the cap. If the cap were to remain, um, or if the cap were, were, were to be removed, um, the same amount of units could would be provided um, as if the cap, uh, about 24 units would be provided where um, Mex Mexi Mexi Mexilado, Mex the new Me the new Mexican restaurant. Sorry, uh, back here, uh, back here. Of course, is the um, parking garage, so that's not applicable. Um, this is the bank center, um, and um, perhaps these parcels could be become apartment buildings. Um, you know, this is the Boltwood uh, in here and the church, so that that wouldn't really obviously wouldn't be applicable and uh, the police station. And um, there is a, um, I don't know if this is a duplex or an apartment building or a converted dwelling. There are multiple units um, in, in this building and, and this is an apartment building. And so these are residential uses. So perhaps those could um, become apartment buildings. I think it's too tight back here. And of course this is the library and you know the parking lot and, and um, the church. Um, so I, I don't think any of these would become apartment buildings. So it's just really, you know, these these parcels here could potentially um, that are not facing the road, they're in the rear um, and that they, you know, you would say, you know, we all know that we need residents to help support businesses. They go hand in hand um, and these uh, parcels back here aren't facing our main corridors. So, you know, the planning department feels comfortable to say, you know, an apartment building behind a mixed use building uh, that's, you know, that that is in the rear is acceptable. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, in, in this where the leader building property is, um, doesn't really make sense to have a mixed use building back here to have uh, retail go back in the sort of rear um, parcel back here uh, away from the main corridor. Um, and, and back here on um, Spring Street, 
um, you know, that's when you're starting to transition back into the RG. Um, and so you could ask yourself is, is it, you know, uh, we, uh, is apartments uh, an appropriate place on Spring Street? Uh, the planning department believes that it is uh, uh, also another appropriate place to have uh, apartments. So Thank you for those, uh, Maureen. I think you know you 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 you're convincing uh, to me anyway are, with regard to this plan. So, um, but, there, but there are businesses on those streets now that would be eliminated, and you might not think it's a good spot for a business, but there's lots of businesses that are kind of off the street, like the by the Amherst Cinema has a ton of small businesses that you walk to. It's actually super interesting to walk down that street, you know. So Amor Cinemas is, is is back here. Yeah, I don't think the you know, I don't think there's enough lot area to to put a, a additional building back here. Uh, to be perfectly honest, um, and so with this, you know, besides this one, you know, if if you meet the sort of buffer, um, so you know that apartment building would be you know would be larger, and that would be that would be it. I don't I don't think you're gonna have. I don't think you're going to have a mixed use building and an apartment building in this little tiny section here, to be perfectly honest. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Maureen, uh, Janet, uh, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Try to keep it brief. I don't know that, I mean, from what I'm hearing, we all would like to make sure that we can bring in additional residential density, but I don't know that anybody is interested in having an apartment on ground floor. Um, why don't we just say no apartments, no new apartments can front Amity, Maine, South Pleasant or North Pleasant, and then just let the, you know, let developers figure out how they can get density in either through mixed use building or some type, type of creative multiple building scenario where they have a, you know, some type of commercial upfront and a standalone apartment building behind it. And I, I, from what I'm hearing, and I would, I would agree with this, I think that's really what we're trying to accomplish, keep that street front vibrant. Maybe we can just make it really simple. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Any comment, Doug? I think what we have before us substantially limits the number of apartments, especially in light of the Zoning Board of Appeals having to issue a special permit for them in the BG. Um, I, 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 so I'm fine with this as, as proposed right now. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Doug. Um, so I think, um, the, the, the things that I've heard is like, do, do we want to modify the, 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 the village district with regard to what Doug had mentioned before? And then do we want to hear public comment um, at all um, since the hearing is closed? Um, don't know the general sentiment of the board on those on those issues. So, um, Andrew? I don't want to pile on on my last comment, so apologies for this, but I think it's, we can, I, I think Jenna makes a, a really good point, right? Like we can, just say no to all of them. But if if none of us want apartment there anyway, why not just close the door now? And and why why not? I mean, why why let other planning boards make that decision? So um, I understand either mechanism will probably have the same same outcome. But if none of us really thinks that we want apartments on ground floor, then then we can be pretty definitive about it um, by by tweaking this. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I guess I, I don't, I can imagine that a couple of apartment buildings downtown would be okay. And that's certainly the limit is, you know, not more than the several that uh, Maureen had, had sketched out there. So it's, it's not, doesn't seem like a, a, a huge uh, loss. And, you know, again, we, we, we've got housing issues in the town that we want to resolve. Um, what about the, um, oh, Janet, you have your hand up. I'm not sure if I said this earlier, but there's there's no reason why um, 
the property owners wouldn't take the buildings that are along those main streets. And some of them are very low and just put up apartment buildings. And even, you know, the older buildings that we all like, there's no protection of those. And those can be taken down. So um, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with Andrew. I, I think it's a decent compromise. Um, I would like to see a cap on the units, you know, on the built on the units behind. I just think you should think about like what, how many cats will jump out of that bag and you'll be surprised. Um, and I do support having more people living downtown, but I just think we need to keep the balance and keep spaces. Great. Any, any, um, oh, uh, Maria. Uh, I just want to reiterate that fact that Tom brought up earlier, which is, this is actually making it more restrictive as far as putting more apartments downtown because it's now a special permit. So I feel like this is pretty safe without totally eliminating that possibility because I feel like, you know, designers, architects, developers, they're creative bunch and they might come up with a solution that actually works pretty well for the street edge. Um, you know, you just never know and to eliminate that possibility entirely might be short-sighted. And, and especially since now we're moving to special permit, there's a lot of, a lot more purview, a lot more oversight onto this. Um, and so I want to fold back into <laughs> the VC. I really want to push for making, I mean, from the very beginning, back when we still had the zoning subcommittee and we were talking about how to bring more of this um, missing middle and more housing, one of the first things was relax apartment um, right, uh, building rights as far as the village centers. I mean, that's why they're village centers. They're designed to be sort of this uh, intermediate density area that's not downtown, it's not residential, it's a sort of, you know, a good balance between the two and that's the perfect place for apartments. And so, uh, you know, relaxing apartment, uh, um, what do you call it? The, the uses, the, the zones that allow more apartments was um, sort of like low hanging fruit in my mind. And so that's my one last push is, you know, I appreciate this really careful study of the downtown, but I do think that VC, both RVC and BBC, I don't know, I can't even find where BBC is. I think there's only a few places, but um, it just, that's my last push is, um, uh, yeah, to, to sort of relax the apartments in that area. But, um, but as far as the downtown, I, I feel like it's very safe now. It's in fact more difficult than in the past, like Tom had pointed out. So um, I'm fine with that as written. Um, I guess another question is for Chris is, are we going beyond the original written uh, version that was already sort of closed as far as the public hearing? I mean, is this still in the same realm of the original um, scope of the amendment article so that we're still good to, you know, not have to restart the process? I think we're still within the scope. We've spoken with, uh, Rob and I have spoken with um, Joel Bard, our town attorney, and he's um, talked to us about, about what is, um, what would be considered within the scope of what was originally presented to town council. And everything that we've done here is, um, less allowing less change than would uh, have been allowed so you know we're narrowing it from what was originally proposed to town council so that would be definitely within the scope hey uh, maureen i'm I, i'm looking at you know page one of three of the uh, of the post zoning bylaw and, and and again i sp is crossed out and then it has sp um, again, but, but I'm, I'm reading this. So the village district is, is, would be site plan review, not a special permit. Is that correct? Or. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry for any potential confusion. So, uh, per, uh currently the zoning bylaw allows, um, apartments by, uh, special permit in the village center residence zoning district. Uh, the planning department had previously uh, recommended that it be by site plan review or uh, um, and um, yeah, so we originally proposed that it be allowed by site plan review. And now since we've heard sort of feedback um, from folks uh, about their concerns about that permit change, um, we're suggesting that, all right, we'll we'll just keep it as special permit. But you know, if the planning board, 
uh, wants to recommend that we take back the take back and um, and do it by site plan review. That that's you know that that please uh, please be you know please uh, indicate that as a board um, and we can um, revise it. Yeah, I'd like to discuss that. Um, it seems, you know, uh, seems like, you know, Doug's suggestion that, you know, we, it should go back to, um, <laughs> uh, back to site plan review uh, and, you know, make it a little bit easier. I mean, there's enough restrictions, I think, in terms of how, you know, apartments would be able to be, you know, built there. I mean, it's, you would need, a, you know, generous setback and, and things like that. Um, but I'd be interested in me hearing what other board members think about that. So we have Janet and, and then. So my, I have a cut process. Yeah. So I have a sort of a process question. So we're, we're kind of honing in on the BG. Um, I would like to hear members of the public and talk about that. And then if we're going to go off into the village centers, I would like to look at the Maureen's um, diagrams. I also would like to take a break. So maybe we could hear some residents and then take a break and come back. But I, I'm kind of, I haven't really, I, I'd like, I'd like to feel like, I don't know if we can finish the BG, but I think if we're going to talk about the village centers, um, it'd be good to look at some of those diagrams too. So. So it's a hard okay. discussion to manage. I can see it. Yeah, it, it is eight thirty. Um, um, and then I guess as as a board, we'd have to entertain whether we, we take public comment or not. Um, I see Johanna and Andrew's hands up, and then Doug. So Johanna. Great. Thanks. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation tonight. Um, on my understanding. Standing, maybe I misinterpreted this, but if we want to take public comment, we basically have to reopen the public hearing. And in order to do that, we need to give two weeks notice. And given that we've had apartments on the agenda five times at the planning board and the other, um, I'm a little bit inclined to, to move ahead um, and not reopen the public hearing. Um, in terms of the downtown, um, I have been, I think, you know, People have said like this actually clarifies and restricts um, apartments downtown. And so I think I've been moved by that and I'm comfortable with the plan. One question that I had, like Maureen, on your drawing, it kind of had these little yellow blocks. Those are purely theoretical, right? Like it could technically be a much longer strip of frontage that is apartment as long as it's 500 feet away from the next one, right? Yeah, uh, correct. So the one that has the call out that says existing, that is the existing building size is a three unit building. Um, and then the other ones, um, those are just measurements of what 500 feet would look like. And I just put in a little box. So that doesn't indicate the size of the building. Um, yeah. And so, you know, so then let's just pretend there is that you know the proposed apartment building, um, the 500 foot uh, measurement would be based off of the corners of that building to the next um, the next spot along the main main corridors. Okay. And then, you know, the village centers. I mean, I don't know. It seems to me like North Square is thriving and getting a lot of attention, and like. You know, I see some of the other village centers and they kind of feel like they need they need more density to support more of the cool shops that then everybody who kind of lives in that catchment area will be. So I'm leaning towards what Maria is saying, you know, like let's let's steer residential to our village centers. And I do think doing it by site plan review rather than special permit would would help kind of ease that. So those are my thoughts right now. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Doug? I just wanted to say I, I agree with what Maria was saying and, and what John, Johanna said. Thank you. OK, so um, it, it doesn't look like we're going to take public comment. Um, 
which is which is fine. Again, the the hearing's been closed, but um, it seems like the one um, suggestion that that's that maybe we can move is is uh, changing the uh, apartments in the in the in the village districts, you know, back to site plan review. Is that something that we can uh, kind of have a straw poll on uh, with regard to recommendation, and then maybe just move to an overall recommendation of, of the zoning bylaw and, and and wrap this up. So, uh, Janet. Just to clarify, this is actually probably our third detailed discussion, deep discussion of apartments. We barely discussed it May 12th. We never discussed it on June 16th. And then on July 4th, 14th, we had four or five zoning, four zoning amendments we were talking, plus the BL. And then we had the public hearing on July 21st, which was five hours long with four zoning amendments. So I, I think this is the longest discussion we've had. And I think we should let the public have some participation in it because it, it's been not super deep. I, I would be really unhappy if we voted on this whole thing and we haven't gone through Maureen's charts. I don't know why she prepared them if we're not gonna talk about them. And I think I would like to look at the different village centers and the, the changes in zoning before I decide if SPR or SP is the way to go. Um, I had a lot of questions about those. Okay, uh, Doug, okay. and then maybe Maureen, you can respond to that, but Doug. Well, it sounded, Jack, like you were ready for some sort of motion. So I guess I'll put out the motion that we adopt this or recommend of town council that this, this proposed change be adopted with the one revision that the RVC stay at site plan review. And we can either move that forward or not. Sounds good. Is there someone that wants to second that? And then we can have a discussion. Maria? Second. Okay. So um, uh, Maureen, what, um, what can you present to us for the village centers uh, with regard to what Janet was referring to? Uh, sure. Uh, just, uh, let me pull up my PowerPoint. Um, uh, just bear with me for one second. Um, so, can folks see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, I believe um, you would want to um, see the slides related to the. Um, uh, RVC, the residence, uh, the village uh, residence village center, and the BVC, the business village center. So, um, I'm, we're gonna. I'll show you um, the North Amherst um, area that includes both the RVC and the BVC. Um, so, this is the intersection of um, North Pleasant and uh, Route 63, which is um, Meadow Street, then which then turns into Pine Street. Um, and just as some landmarks uh, to orient you, um, this little triangle here uh, is the North Library, Amherst Library. Um, the parcel uh, to the west of that is the North Amherst School Building. And then this corner lot um, is the Amherst uh, uh, Zeon uh, Church. And so in the, the RVC is shown in beige and, um, Per table three, uh, the dimensional regulations, um, a lot size of two, of, um, two and a half acres um, would provide a three floor, 25 unit apartment building um, with um, also maintaining 40% uh, of that, of the land for open space and landscaping and whatnot. Um, there is only one parcel within this focus area that it, it is um, more than um, two and a half acres um, that could provide, um, um, that would benefit from the, the cap being removed 
and that's this parcel right here, which currently has 48 uh, units on, on that site. Um, so, you know, maybe uh, I would, so theoretically, they could add a couple more on this property. It's very unlikely, if not impossible, since um, there, um, it is adjacent to the Mill River and so it, with its associated wetlands. Um, and so I, I would, so then that would limit the amount of developable land and whatnot. Um, so that is very uh, unlikely that that would be developed or redeveloped or expanded upon. And then I wanted to, uh, to show, um, you know, there are uh, a lot of smaller parcels. And so I wanted to um, see how many units could be provided um, along Meadow Street. Um, so I looked at the parcels that you can see the arrow. So the parcels between here and here, um, I added up the lot area for all those parcels, which get you, um, 206,000 square feet. That's probably mm, four or five acres. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and so with that, um, you could provide 48 units um, that would be on in a, within a three floor building. Um, and uh, they, again, you would, the, the the applicant would need to maintain 40% uh, uh, for open space. So I, I would envision a sort of long, you know, you could envision maybe two buildings or maybe a long um, sort of narrow building. Um, think of like maybe brownstones or something like that, where there's, um, you know, a, a gracious front yard. And then there'd probably be a driveway that goes back here. They would have parking behind the um, apartment building and then maybe a, a driveway coming back out. Um, to add to that, you know, these parcels, um, the acquisition of these parcels, you know, you could go on Zillow today and see how much are, do these parcels cost to buy probably $300,000, $500,000 each. Um, and so adding all that up, that's, that's a chunk of change right there. And um, the uh, construction costs, um, you know, it costs somewhere between four and nine million dollars um, to build a, you know, a 48 unit building uh, development. Um, so, to, so, you know, I believe that that's a hard sell for a developer to even be enticed to build here, given the acquisition cost and construction cost and very, you know, uh, 48 units is, you know, is, is a lot, but it's, 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 is the cost, is that cost effective? And the one scenario that I could see it cost effective to a developer in and enticing is uh, talking about um, owner occupied um, apartment buildings, such as condominiums. Um, and so, Perhaps in that market, that would actually be feasible instead of a, a rental market. Um, and uh, I believe, and I believe the planning department uh, also believes that that would fit nicely in a in a down in a village center. Um, when you think in terms of the need for owner occupied uh, rent, uh, owner occupied dwelling units. Um, and so, okay, so we talked about the RVC. Now I'll go to the next slide which is the BVC, which is shown in the hatching, the red hatching. And so per the table three dimensional regulations, um, there is no lot area and additional lot area required um, for the BVC. And so um, the numbers of uh, the amount of units allowed if the cap were was removed, um, is um, increased. Um, and so a lot size of 25,000 square feet or 0.6 acres could provide a three floor, 25 unit apartment building with uh, dedicating 30% of the total lot area for open space and landscaping and whatnot. Um, a lot size of, um, we'll say 100,000 square feet or 2.3 acres could provide a three floor, 93 unit apartment building with uh, providing 30% of 
um, open space. Um, there are four parcels that are uh, equal to or greater than 25,000 square feet in size. Um, and so, um, so there is opportunity to provide um, apartment buildings um, in, in these locations that would benefit from the removal of um, the cap. And let's see here, this is the RBC. We, there's very limited amount of properties that would benefit from the removal of the cap. Um, and those are shown in red, which is the existing Aspen Chase apartments. Um, and the yellow parcels uh, would also benefit. Um, and so again, so Aspen Chase, um, it's an existing apartment building. Um, I. It looks and feels that they're maxed out. Maybe they could add a couple more. I, to be honest, I don't know how many apartment built, uh, apartment uh, units are there, but um, this yellow parcel here is the Salem Place condos. This yellow parcel is the East Amherst Village apartments. Um, I can't recall what's here. And uh, this is currently, I believe, being developed uh, with a couple of, um, single family homes. And I think that's uh, perm uh, is uh, currently being um, constructed. And then zoning at May, so at zoning um, at May, um, yeah. Let me uh, just pause a minute, uh, Janet, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, could we go back to the um, North Amherst one? Cause it, um, so I have a question. I have two questions. One of them is um, with the um, BBC, um, if you added another story, you could add more units, right? And that's allowed, that's, that's, there's a footnote eight on height in, um, actually there's a footnote eight on height and maximum stories for everybody. So if you, um, so the parcels that we're looking at, if they had an extra story, they would all have more apartments, the potential for more apartments, right? And then, so that's, that's first question. The second question is, I keep on wondering, like, you know, what, how many units could you build as an apartment without a cap, given, you know, the various dimensional tables and the many waivers versus mixed use? Like how many, like, you know, like when I'm looking at the parcel, I think you have a 78 or you know, the one that's in um, North Amherst, and it's mostly a little commercial strip where I've eaten many pizzas. If the incentive there is to take that building down and put an apartment center, combine lots, wouldn't it be, you know, like, I still think it'd be better to have mixed use because you keep the businesses there, you get a ton of resident rental units. And so like, what's the difference? Like, so if I took, you know, if I combined, you know, the two point, you know, a lot size of nine point, you know, 99, 643, the 2.3 acres, if I put that together, um, and I, how many units could I build? What if I added another story? But what if I was doing a mixed use building there at three stories or four stories? What's the real difference, except that I've lost, you know, with the apartment buildings, I've lost businesses. Can you, I mean, do you understand what I'm asking you? It's like, what, what, what do you get that you couldn't just get through a mixed building? Like how many more units by the apartments thing? Because again, these are all village centers. They're all focusing on a mix of businesses and keeping them vibrant. Yeah, Maureen. Uh, or, well, perhaps Chris or Rob could weigh in about the footnote A comment about the building, the floor, um, maximum amount of floors. Um, but, you know, uh, I mean, the, uh, but to answer your other question, I mean, the obvious difference is uh, you know, is there, you know, non-residential use on the first floor versus, um, or, you know, or is there not, you know, um, that, that would be the, the difference between the two uses. Um, and what again, like 10, 10 more units. Oh, how many more, more units? Um, uh, let's see here. Um, hmm. uh, oh, I wish I had my, I wish I had my calculations in front of me. Um, <laughs> me um, so, um, uh, yeah, probably, you know, I would say my guesstimate, we're talking probably a difference of uh, 10 to 20 units uh, um, that, you know, if, if the, the first floor was 
uh, all residential, then it, it would probably be, you know, 10, 20 units. Um, and then if that was a mixed use building, then that would be non-residential. Chris? It depends on how big the building is. This first example that you have of 25,000 square feet, a three, three floor, 25 unit apartment building would assume that you'd have like seven or eight units on each floor, right? Uh, eight, I guess, isn't eight times three, 24. Anyway, so you would have eight um, units on a floor. So you would add um, eight, you would subtract eight units if the ground floor units went away. And they, you know, then you'd only have 16 units. And I think that's right. I think that's how you would figure it out. You just figure out how many units do you have on a floor and you subtract the ground floor and then you get the number of units that you would have in a mixed use building. Well, I was I giving, I was giving the forty percent. You remember that we did, we, you know, there's like, you're only keeping forty percent for the businesses on the first floor. I see. Yeah, so it's you know, so it's a couple, you know, maybe it's you know, you lose three out of a twenty-five unit building. Maybe on a ninety-three unit building, you lose ten. Mm -hmm. You keep the and, businesses. And just to keep in mind, in this. Uh, has added a whole other layer to my these build outs where the build outs are reflected in the circles of my estimate is that to keep with uh, the proposal of uh, having a diverse mix of build, building counts for apartment buildings, um, uh, there there is a mix of different uh, unit types. So in all of these, there's, you know, single uh, one bedroom units, two bedroom units, three bedroom units, and 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 uh, um, some studios. So I, I really tried to diversify uh, the mix of bedrooms. Um, and so with that, the unit size um, changes, you know, a little bit, you know, dependent on the, the amount of bedrooms. So um, I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, yeah, you, you can proceed with your. Okay, sure. Okay, so work. then moving on to, oh, yeah, we talked about the RG zoning districts at Maine and Triangle. Okay, so we're going to look at the, this slide looks at the neighborhood business zoning district, which is in, uh, reflected in, in purple dots. And um, Due to, uh, per the table three dimensional regulations and the floor area ratio requirements for the BN, um, you would need a two acre lot to provide a two floor, 25 unit apartment building with 40% uh, of um, open, 40% uh, of the total lo lot area for open space. None of these parcels are large enough to provide a 25 unit apartment building. Um, and here, um, this is the BL zoning district. There's only three, three parcels. It, uh, they're located along the corner of Dickinson and College Street. The O'Connell lot is located right at the corner. Um, none of these parcels are large enough to provide a 25 plus apartment building. Um, this is the BVC zoning district located at the corner of Dickinson and Main Street. Um, and this is where Triangle Street is right here. And then this parcel right here is um, Elements Hot Tub, just to give you another landmark. Um, there are only, uh, I'm not gonna go through all these bullets, um, but th this last, I'm gonna try to um, try to, to speed this along, just focus on this last bullet because that is sometimes the summary of the slide. So there's only two parcels um, that are large enough to provide um, a three uh, floor uh, um, are large enough to benefit from the capping removed. Um, and so those two parcels are, is this parcel here and this back parcel here. Um, this is owned, I think by the train station or Amtrak or, or whatever, um, train people. And, um, and th so this, so I would say this is probably unlikely to be developed. So perhaps this spot back lot right here could benefit from the um, cap removal. Um, and then zoning districts at College Street, South East Street and Main Street. So in beige, oh, and so again, um, let's see here. So this is College Street along here. Uh, this is Southeast Street, 
which then connects you to Main Street right here. And RVC um, is reflected in um, the beige color. Um, there are three parcels that are um, uh, e equal to or greater to, greater to 2.5 acres. Um, and that is the, the threshold to um, provide 25 units or more. And um, those three parcels include the Fort River School, uh, the Watson Farms Apartment, which is owned and managed by the Amherst Housing Authority, I believe, and um, the town of Amherst property right here. Um, and so those are the um, only um, parcels that could uh, benefit from the cap being removed. The other parcels are just just too small. Um, uh, this is um, this slide um, focuses on the BVC, which is represented in the sort of red pink catching. Um, and to um, let's see here, there are seven parcels that are equal to or greater than um, twenty five thousand square feet. In, in size. Um, and so those parcels, which I'll um, wave my little mouse, um, those parcels um, include this one, this one, let's see here, hold on, uh, this one, uh, this one here, this, these two back ones here, um, this parcel along South East Street, which is where the recently approved mixed use building um, was uh, approved by the planning board. And um, this parcel that is across the street from that, um, that, that uh, approved project. So, um, so those are seven parcels that could provide 25 units or more uh, in, a, in a single building on, that, on, on those uh, respective parcels. And then here is the BL zoning um, district along University Drive. Um, here, this street uh, here is Amity Street and the street along here is University Drive. Oops, sorry, sorry, oops. Uh, and then this is uh, Route 9. And, um, and uh, this parcel is where Big Y Plaza is located. And you would need to have 2.6 acres um, or uh, 116,000 square feet to provide a three floor, 25 unit apartment building with having 15% um, uh, of total lot area for open space. There are four parcels larger than 116,000 square feet that would benefit from um, the cap being removed. And let's see here, I'll, I'll point to them. So this parcel here at the corner of Amity and University Drive where is it still called the ABC, the hangar? Um, yeah. That, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, that, that parcel here, uh, the part, no, okay, hold on, that parcel, this parcel here, which I believe is um, perhaps where 70 University Drive is, the mixed use building, um, I believe is. Yeah, they got that. redeveloped, right? Yeah, so that parcel here, let's see here, um, where Big Y is. So one, two, two, three, and four. Um, hmm. Sorry, I, 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 I don't know everything off the top of my head. Of uh, I don't know if this is where the post office is or um, which um, sort of um, entity is located here. Maybe Chris can point that out. But anyways, we, we're familiar with the sorts of businesses that are along, along University Drive. Um, and then here is the zoning district at Pomeroy Village. Um, and so this is West Street, uh, which is also uh, Route 116. And then here is uh, West Pomeroy Lane and then turns into Pomeroy Lane. Um, and this slide shows the RVC zoning district, which is shown in the beige color. Um, and this is where an existing 25 unit um, apartment building is located. And, uh, and then further landmarks, uh, this is this parcel has Mission Cantina and this parcel has um, like the Mona Dove. Um, okay, and so let's see here, per table three, 
uh, you would need to have a parcel of 111,000 square feet or 2.5 acres to provide a three floor, 25 unit apartment building with having 40% uh, of the lot area for open space. And um, there's only one parcel that is equal to or greater to, uh, than uh, 111,000 square feet. And that is the where that uh, existing 25 unit um, apartment building is located, which is owned and uh, ma managed by the Amherst Housing Authority. Um, and so um, they couldn't even expand it because that, that, is the, that is the amount that they could provide. They have 25 and they only could provide 25 because of the table th three dimensional re regulations. And then this, um, slide shows the BVC, which is reflected in the red hatching. And uh, you would need to have, um, uh, you know, 25,000 square feet to benefit from having a three floor, 25 unit apartment building. And then you would need uh, upwards to 100,000 square feet for a, a three floor, 93 unit apartment building. There are nine parcels equal to or greater than 25,000 square feet that could um, have a three floor uh, apartment building with 25 or more units. So nine parcels I had mentioned. So um, and Chris may, may need to chime in here. Um, so this is, uh, this parcel would, um, could have 25 units or more, um, which is already developed. Um, and this parcel here, uh, which is already developed um, this parcel is, I believe, um, you know, um, you know, these two parcels here, this one and this one could benefit um, from the uh, cap removal. Um, and so one, two, three, four, oh, and then this parcel here, and this little back parcel here, this parcel here, this parcel here where um, the gas station is, and this parcel. Um, and so, um, you know, as we said earlier, um, you know, retail does need, um, does need the population to support, to support the retail. And we believe that, that if there was an apartment building built in this intersection, this cluster here, it would actually, um, encourage the developer to provide retail or non-residential uses because now they have that population to support the 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 viability of of that business or businesses and so they do go hand in hand and these uh, you know these village centers um, are places where we want to encourage you know both residential and non-residential. And as I just said, they go hand in hand. Um, this uh, zoning district, which is the BVC, is um, at the corner of West Street and West Bay Street, West, uh, West Bay Street. And this is where Atkins um, Farm Market is located. Um, these two parcels back here um, could um, benefit from the cap removal. Again, as I just said in the previous slide, uh, you know, uh, retail and residential go hand in hand, um, where, where if you uh, have a population um, that would um, support uh, more retail and, or, you know, in general, uh, non-residential um, and would make it uh, enticing um, for a developer um, for, e for either of the uses. Um, and so uh, zoning along Belchertown Road, um, this is uh, Route 9 or Belchertown Road, and this is uh, Gatehouse Road. And the existing use here is um, the Amherst Insurance Agency. And that one parcel uh, could uh, benefit from the cap removal. Um, and um, I, I believe that building was uh, recently in, um, you know, redeveloped. Um, and so I, I'm not sure what the feasibility of this being redeveloped in the near future. But, you know, this parcel is large enough to accommodate probably two us uses um, um, or two buildings, maybe retail and, and, and residential. Um, it would be interesting to see, um, see this redeveloped. Um, and 
Um, so that's that's about it that I had. I think I went through all the, the zoning districts. That was, yeah, very informative, Maureen. Uh, I see uh, Janet and uh, Maria and then Doug. So um, I just, I want to, I'm assuming that if you add a floor, you can add, you know, if you if you have a 25 units on three floors and you can add a floor, then you have 25 plus, you know, eight or something like that. So I'm just assuming you could add floors and you get more apartments. But, you know, when you look, when I look at Pomeroy, which has a lot of large lots, it's, it's clear to me that hundreds and hundreds of apartment units can go into Pomeroy Village. Um, Atkins, I counted at least 500 just on two lots. Um, and then, you know, even the Amherst Insurance Center property looked like it could take um, a few hundred. And so I think it'd be useful to people to know when we're going to, if you're lifting the cap on apartment buildings in the different village centers, particularly the, maybe the quieter ones, we need to know the unit count, like what's possible. We asked this question about the BL um, on North Pleasant Street. We asked it on Triangle Street. And I, I think before we talk as a board or make a decision as a board, we should know what we're talking about with the village centers. To me, it's like a red flag that we should be doing village center planning in Pomeroy Village. We should be doing it in Atkins. I know people would be a little startled who live around there if say 500 apartments went in those spots. Um, they may love that idea. They may wanna see more of a mixed use thing. They, wanna, they may wanna expand the, um, the business district. This is why we have planning and village center planning. I don't know why, you know, I, I hear we had a planning process that started in 2018 for village center planning. It, it's obviously gone in fits and starts, but I, I do think that this is a huge change and it's a change that's gonna happen without people who live there knowing or virtually anybody in this town at this point, um, at just the beginning, the end of the summer. I think we can't, I, we have to know the numbers and we have to have tell people about it. I can't be more clear. Okay, let's hear from some of the other board members. Um, uh, Maria, and then and then Andrew. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for that, Maureen. That really was helpful because it shows to me just how few parcels in the BVC and the RVC actually even benefit from that lifting up a cap for apartments. So in the RVC, it was four parcels that... Um, you'd be able to build over the 24 unit. So that's not a big risk. BVC, the two village centers, Pomeroy and Fort River were the two that had the most number of parcels that would benefit from that calf lift. Otherwise um, it was only three other BC, BVC areas. It was like two, three and one as far as the number of parcels that would be impacted by that lift on the cap. So that just tells me even more so that changing it from SP to SPR makes a lot of sense because it's not a huge number of parcels that can even build with the new uh, cap lifts. Like what they can do now is already the 24 units and what they could do with the lift in the maximum number of apartments is a handful of parcels like you just showed. So it just sort of further instilled in my mind that, you know, the, the, the relaxing of SP to SPR makes a lot of sense. Um, so that was a really great to see those numbers. As far as Janet's comment about 500 units, uh, uh, it's hard to throw out numbers, scary numbers like that without um, seeing real data. And I mean, with the 40% required open space for the RVC, um, you know, that, that's very few units. I guess the only two districts would be the two BBCs, the Fort River one and the Pomeroy one. Those were the two that had like seven parcels and nine parcels that could benefit from that cap lift. But you, as you said, most of them were already developed. Um, there was only a couple I saw that were like empty lots right now. So again, the risk seems very low relative to what's already allowable. Um, so I, I, I mean, your sort of presentation kind of really set my mind. Like, I, I think it's just a very safe thing to do SP to SPR. Um, I know there'll be a lot of comments from emails and um, the same, you know, group that we keep getting these comments from, but I just want to make sure, you know, 
it's hard to gauge the whole town based on the few emails we get. So I, I just, I hope you're not being sort of like um, pressured by a group versus like, um, I mean, has the CRC or town council weighed in um, or are they just sort of following the recommendations of the planning board and the planning department? So um, if it's more data we need, maybe just those two areas, the two BBCs would be worth studying. But uh, the RVC, there's only four parcels that would even possibly have the um, chance to build more with than what's currently allowed. So um, yeah, the, the risk seems really low. So thank you so much for that presentation. It's really good to see all those numbers. Thank you, Maria. Um, Andrew? Thanks, Jack. I, I agree, uh, Maureen, that was super useful going into those deeper dives. Um, I, 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 in principle, I like the idea of making it easier and going from SP to SPR. Um, I, do, I do agree with Janet though. I think like mixed use doesn't preclude us from adding residential. And I think any developer is going to do everything they can to maximize the residential to offset having some, some retail there. And as I looked at some of those areas and I, I couldn't keep track of uh, RVC versus BVC, but like Atkins would probably do great having some residential around there, right? It's got a phenomenal market. Um, and I think that's one of the challenges to Atkins is you have to drive there. Like it's uh, some people, some people never make it over there because of the fact that it's so dependent on car. Um, as I think about, you know, Belchertown Road, um, that's surrounded by housing. It's, it's obviously largely single family, but you've got Rolling Green nearby as well. And that would seem to really benefit from having some type of retail, right? Now, it's, it's, as I hear these examples, it just makes me uh, realize more and more that it's, it's hard for me to say that there is a good sort of one size fits all. I think maybe we do need to consider RVC versus BVC a little bit differently. But I, th I think the overall takeaway for me is that mixed use seems like it could accomplish all of what we're trying to do uh, in that we can still build residential density, but provide amenities. Um, you know, my, my, my mom lives near Shutesbury and I just think of, you know, just Shutesbury, like anyone who lives in Shutesbury has got to leave for everything, right? It's just, it's, and I would hate to think that we're adding more and more housing at the expense of, of something to actually go to. Um, and would just add to like my comments earlier, we're, we're very much focused on, on downtown, right? In, in terms of what I think would make sense and, and, and that would be um, limiting apartments from fronting those, those major arterials. Uh, thanks. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thanks, I mean, I, I think in theory, um, I actually agree with, um, with what Andrew's saying, but I also think that it reinforces our need to put residential near some of these locations and that Atkins thrives off of the people that live in that residential neighborhoods right nearby and have a sidewalk that they walk to Atkins and if you go there at noon and try to get lunch, every single person in that building is actually walked down there and actually in Atkins waiting in line to get their lunch. So that is that building is activated by the residential buildings around it. And I think that happens in all of these different locations. And if we go to Pomeroy and we bring more residences down there, it would bring more business um, in the future because we'd have more people in a direct um, feed into those zones um, and, and people would be shopping within those zones rather than, as you say, driving there with a sense of purpose. Like I'm gonna drive there, park and then leave. The people living in that neighborhood would be using that village center as a resource. And I think in many cases, we need to bring the people to that place first in order to actually make businesses viable um, and not just you know drive up, drive away kinds of businesses. So, so I agree with you that we there is a demand for both of those things. And I think you know the way it's written right now, it allows, if, if there is a need or a demand for mixed use, someone will come in and put retail there. They will put a mixed use building. They will make that choice because they will make a profit off of putting mixed use in that particular place and there will be a demand for it. If they don't see that, they will put a residential building there to bring more people to that neighborhood. And so, so I do think that there is a sense that we're not trying to prescribe it by saying this is better than that, that you know, all of these places are unique. Um, but I do think affording the opportunity for both of those things to take place on the site would be beneficial for everybody. 
Um, I'm going to go with Doug and then Janet. Um, well, I just had a small comment, which is I think the way I moved the question does sort of prescribe that you uh, that we would be we would prefer to have apartments in the RVC immediately next to the BVC, which, you know, in the hope that the, the BVC is where the mixed use would happen. And then the residential apartments might be, uh, you know, on the periphery around that area. So I think I think we're actually in a good place with with my motion. <laughs> I agree, uh, Janet. So one thing that we haven't talked about much is lot consolidation, um, and so. You know, when you talk about what is on the ground now, and you're like, well, not that many lots are available, but obviously with greater apartment density, there's incentive for people to, you know, build in those lots. Actually, a lot of times one person owns several lots next to each other. I really, you know, when I, it's, I think that we have this one size fits all, let's lift the cap. Um, every village center is different. The downtown is different from, from Southeast Street, you know, whatever that is down there. And we're not doing any planning. We don't know what these buildings are. We have no 3D build outs. You know, we can put a 93 unit apartment building or two next to Atkins or, you know, whatever. And, you know, this, you know, it's like, okay, now we've done that and let's see what happens. And then maybe it's four stories. So it's not 93 units, maybe it's 120 units um, because we, we have footnote A. That's this is not we're a planning board. This is this is like a not a one size fit all sort of situation. I really do think we need to look at things one by one. And that is in fact what our master plan says. It doesn't say increase density, lift caps, and see how it goes. It says do village center planning, downtown planning. This planning board was saying to do downtown planning last year. Um, and we've gone from that to this kind of you know, like free for all. North Amherst Village Center is got like seven historic district buildings in the RVC and the BVC that has to go differently than Atkins or Pomeroy. Um, people who live in Pomeroy deserve to have some notice of this. Maria, you're tired of hearing from the same five people that you, you're not listening to. We don't talk to anybody else. Like these people come to this meeting and we haven't informed the community in any way of what these zoning proposals are. We have community participation officers, we have emails, we have lists. We have no clue what people are thinking because they have no clue what we're talking about here. And so I just think, you know, I, I came into this thinking, I really think that this should be referred back to the planning board and planning department for some planning. Let's, let's, let's take a village center, let's take two village centers. We are gonna do downtown planning with the form-based zoning person let's we were talking about doing downtown planning last year on the planning we all know it needs to have happen um we know that it, you know and so I, I i would refer this back it's too big of a change in too many places with too little information and it's going to be a stunner you know and people deserve to know what's going on in their community and reflect on it and if you don't want to hear from them that's fine but at least tell them if you don't want to listen to them, at least tell them and have them talk and don't listen. But I really think we're, you know, this is this is this is probably of all the zoning amendments we've looked at as quickly as I think we have looked at them. This I think is the most far-reaching one. And I think it Thank could you, undermine, undermine businesses also. Thank you, Janet. Um, so you know, again, I I I thought Maureen's presentation was was um very informative. And uh we do have uh, a motion. To vote and um, and then we are short on time uh, and now you know we're going to have to reschedule uh, some of the items on our agenda for other dates. But I'm wondering if um, at this point um, we've heard I think again from Maureen uh, that you know there's it seems to be fairly limited in terms of what may happen and what may happen could be really good. For the village centers, and um, um, I think at, at this point, I would just, you know, ask that we 
with any objection that we just have a vote on on the motion that's on the on the floor here. So, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. I, I'm, I'm prepared to vote because I do think that this is moving us in the right direction. But I agree with Janet that that we should get down into like really more detailed village center by village center by by town center planning. And let's not lose sight of that. But um, anyhow, just wanted that that additional context before I voted. Thanks. OK. What's the motion? Can we read that again? The motion that we have is to accept with the changes that were made. Um, Maureen did some text edits, and then we're going to we're going to change the review of the uh, village centers from. It got switched back <laughs> a couple of times, but we're going to change that back to uh, site plan review from special permit for this apartment bylaw. It was just the just the RVC. In the RVC only. Any further discussion? All right, let's do a roll call then. Uh, Maria. Approved. And Andrew. Aye. Doug. Aye. Tom. Aye. Janet. No. And Johanna. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you all, Maureen. You know, great job breaking down all these different, you know, things. You 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 always do a great job with with the GIS and and everything at your disposal there. So uh, appreciate it. Um. So, uh, Chris, we are not going to get to this parking one. We're not going to get to the mixed use building one, and then the election of officers and planning board reorganization. I think it's the late in the game for all these things. So you mentioned next week, um, or we also have, I don't have anything, I don't have anything listed for the 15th. Uh, so. 15th is a Jewish holiday. Oh, uh, so we're not. Holy day. It's a Yom Kippur. So we can't have a meeting that night. Um, oh, okay. But we could have a meeting next Wednesday, which I think is the third night of Rosh Hashanah. Um, but I think we can go ahead and have a meet, have a meeting that night if people are available. Um, and then another idea would be to have a meeting on the 22nd. So I think the 8th and the 22nd are possibilities if people are available. The 29th already has a pretty heavy uh, agenda. So, so it's, it's the 8th. Or the 22nd, I know the 22nd, I'm, I'm kind of tied up. Um, how are people looking for next next Wednesday? I can't do either. I, I was looking forward not to meeting on the planning board every week, yeah. but I can't do it. Uh, how about others? Oh, I'm free both days. Okay. Doug so, and Tom are free both days. Yes. And um, what is Andrew saying? Maybe. Yeah, I I've, I've taken a new job with a lot of the West Coast people, so I don't know what. Um, I'm not sure how the schedule is laying out yet. I'll probably need a couple of weeks for that to sort out. Yeah. Again, I'm good for next week, but the 22nd, uh, a little bit more more iffy. Um, so what about what Johanna? I think I could make either night, although I might have to pull some strings on the home front. <laughs> yeah. What about Maria? Maria's good. So we have Doug, Tom, Andrew, maybe Jack, Johanna and Maria who can all meet next week for the eighth. Yep. So that seems like a, I mean, uh, are you, Janet, are you out of? I, I'm, just, I'm supposed to be out of town. And then I, I can't, I definitely can't do it the 22nd. I have a thing, a health thing. 
Um, can can Andrew do it? I didn't hear him say yes. So I didn't hear him say no. I, I, I'm not sure yet, Janet. I've, I've got, uh, I've taken a new job and, and I've got some West Coast folks. So it's quite possible that I'm going to be rolling into after five o'clock hours for work obligations. But okay. I can't, yeah. In terms of the weekly piece, that's going to be tough for this month for me to commit to. What about the 14th, which is a Tuesday? Is that any better? Um, let, let me check my calendar. Hang on. Well, it, normally I would have ag commission, but I, that doesn't <laughs> seem to be happening. Does Maureen have something on Tuesday the 14th? Uh, well, uh, not at 6.30. No, you have DAAC, so that's right. And, so. and we have the CRC meeting at 2 o'clock. And CRC at 2. So the 14th would be a possibility if people want to try for that. Yeah. <clears throat> so Doug is yes. Jack is a yes. Johanna? We're talking Tuesday the 14th. Yep. Um, yes. And um, Janet? I could do the 14th. And um, Tom? Yes, Tom is yes. And who else do we have? Um, Maria? Marius, yes, and Andrew? Same answers before, maybe. Maybe. One, two, three. So that's um, either way. I, oh, so one night we have five potential, one night we have six. Good. So it looks like the 14th is the better night. So okay. go for the 14th. What's on the 29th? I've forgotten. The 29th is um, the preliminary subdivision plan for Archipelago. Um, East Center Commons, John Robleski is coming back to talk about 446 Main Street. Um, you have this rezoning of parcel 14A33 behind the CBS. Um, we potentially have the Historical Commission members coming to talk to you about a, a, a newly revised demo delay bylaw. And then we have, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all. A lot. <laughs> okay, so we're we're not doing the eighth, the fourteenth. Fourteenth, yeah. Okay. Is that good? That's good. Okay. And we'll just pretty much completing the agenda. So we'll do parking, mixed use buildings, and um, election of officers and planning board reorg. Is that right? Okay. Is there going to be a salary increase with these extra meetings? So. <laughs> Pam's, Pam asks me that. <laughs> Actually, that's we, we, really true for you guys. No, I don't. Can, can, the, can the town distribute like little gold stars that we can put on our of lapel? Them. Come on, can we get like gift cards to like share coffee? <laughs> Come on, something. A little, mm -hmm. Spend some money downtown Amherst. <laughs> We'll have to talk to developers about developing a slush fund for our our get on the card. VID. Come on, let's go. Kitchen uh... Cantina gift card would be good for me. So we could have oh potluck. I just want to get on the ad commission. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's mine. <laughs> but Chris and Jack, we do have an ANR that if we could oh. that ANR, oh, an ANR. yeah, right. Year, and that would be really great. Okay. You want to do that? I think we can do that. Yep. Okay. That's, should be easy. Famous last words. This is an ANR that relates to property that Ron Laverdier owns along Research Drive in East Amherst. Um, Research Drive, you may know, is where Kate Atkinson has her office. Oh, okay. And um, it's that one that Pam is pointing out. So Kate Atkinson needs more parking, and she has made arrangements with the fellow who owns parking, um, or owns a lot, 
near Old Belchertown Road. She's purchasing this lot number two from him. And in order to connect the two lots, she would like to purchase a one foot wide strip of land owned by Ron Lavertier. And that's what this ANR is about. Um, uh, connecting Kate Atkinson's two parcels with this one foot strip. So if you would um, agree that this is not something that requires subdivision uh, approval, then we can get uh, Jack to sign it. How does the one foot help? Yeah. It connects the two properties. So it's a, so sort of like, it'd be it, like a hammerhead sort of thing? Makes it easier to, um, to uh, say that the parking that's going to be proposed on lot two is associated with the building that is um, where Kate Atkinson has her practice. So you can combine those two lots into one. Does she have the parcel to the right as well? To the right has a house on it. You mean lot one? No, Which... I mean, I mean, you, you, your cursor has been on the one that is kind of in the middle of those three. And what about the one to the right? The one is to the right um, is Camel, former, Camel no. Lee, Camel Lee or something? Where it says Carex. See there, there you go. Okay. Does Carex she own, LLC. Yeah. Does she own that? No, that's owned by Mickey Mark or used to be owned by Mickey Marcus. Um, SWCA, I think is the owner okay. now. So, yeah. so her connection will be through that one foot strip that goes along the bottom of Carex? Yes, and Rob Mora um, goes along with this. He agrees <laughs> that that one foot strip will connect those two properties. Wow. So she actually owns, so her place Dragonfly Health owns that shaded area that's called Research Drive and people have a right to pass and repass over that easement. So she actually owns all the way to the one foot strip. And then she will own the one foot strip that's to the uh, east side of the Carrick's property where um, Mickey Marcus used to be. And then she will own the one foot strip associated with lot two. So they will all be connected by that uh, little one foot strip. It's sort of a magic of, um, a and R, uh, what, what an A and R can accomplish. Could could you just build a parking lot there and just use it? What, what actually stops her from just doing that without the one? I mean, on lot two. Yeah, like can't, why can't you just? Because build it needs to be associated with the use. Otherwise, it becomes um, something that's probably a. Um, it would it would probably become something other than what we're proposing it to be. We're proposing it to be a parking lot that's associated with the use of the Dragonfly Health building. And if it were completely separate, then it would have to be shared parking, leased parking, um, commercial parking, or something other than parking that's an accessory to her building. And by the way, this is being done under Article 14, which is sort of an emergency. Uh, it was our temporary zoning that was passed um, last November. So there was a provision in there to allow medical uses to um, expand or change. So do you agree that Jack can sign this? Essentially what you're saying is it doesn't have to go through subdivision, uh, the subdivision process. Yeah, I just like full disclosure of people. I have worked on Research Drive with uh, over the last 20 years with three different companies. Um. <laughs> I feel like I don't understand enough to say yes or no. So I would just defer to the group. Yeah, I mean, I don't see any objection. If anyone speak, I don't know. Johanna anything, has her so. hand up. Johanna. I mean, it, it seems fine. It doesn't seem like it should go through subdivision review. It's one foot, Rob Mora signed off on it. Like, does it feel a little hokey or, you know, yeah. Bizarre. A little bizarre, <laughs> but um, seriously. Um, but I, I think it's fine if you sign it, Jack, personally. 
as long as Rob says it's good, I'm good with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll be calling on you to sign this. I, I can either drive down to your house or you can come up here one or the other. I'd love to get on my house and come visit you. <laughs> it's a big thrill. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, good. That's it then. All right. So we can, uh, again, continue the agenda, the portion of the agenda to the 14th, Tuesday, um, and adjourn now. So adjourn at 9. 39 is that right yeah Thank you, Jack. i really appreciate Pretty that good. yeah well safe travels janet wherever you go on i'm going to the Jack. quad cities quad cities you don't know where that I is iowa yeah yeah wow yeah what if that... i said jack what if i said i had a trip every thursday morning <laughs> every other thursday morning could we cap i this? would say be safe and